five, and then it didn't. It didn't normally it like explodes with thumb thumbs ups, and we oh, got three of them. We have three, little but ones. I didn't see any of them on the on the little thing. So, uh, <laughs> but you have tissues for today. I do because it finally caught up the to you. The Lord saw fit to give me a little bit of a trial. You know, I can really hear it in your voice through the microphone too. You're just a little squeakier. Oh, really? Squeaky. Yeah, it's kind of like. You know how, uh, no offense to any of you ladies out there, if this is you, you know how some ladies have like that kind of, it's kind of a cutesy little okay. high pitch to their voice, Sure. right? You you definitely. It, doesn't, the, you, it doesn't lower my voice. I always feel like I have such a deep voice when I'm sick. No, you just you kind of, kind of, just up a little more. And Weird. So, yeah, yeah. Um, probably the nasal reality going on there. So, yeah. Hey, uh, this is our 50th episode of Stop the White Noise. Did you know that? No. No. Isn't I that didn't cool? I didn't know that. I mean, technically, that means we've almost been doing it for a year, so we could wait two weeks back. This is our one year anniversary of Stop the White Noise, but um, uh, it's kind of a big deal, especially as a podcast. In the podcasting world, you hit 50, you hit 100. Those are, those are big moments. Uh, Brief History of Power just hit 100 a couple of weeks ago, I think. So okay. that, was, that was a big deal. But we do. You know, one of those a week, so that's you know almost two years of, of work there. But fifty episodes since you came on full time, and we rebranded the entire thing to mm-hmm. yeah. So does it feel like it's been that long to you? Um, not no, not really. Seems really fast to me. Yeah, yeah, I felt like I did the computer side for a lot longer. Yeah, yeah, but that was part of that fifty, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think initially, I think so. I don't know. I have to go back and look. Yeah, I guess I was. I did have a microphone for a while while I was doing the computer. Yeah. Huh. So uh, since it is uh, the 50th episode, I wanted to call that to your attention. But I probably should say the thing that we normally say, which is the good news of Jesus Christ and remind you of this, that, that he is risen. And that means you've been paid for and that makes you immortal now. And he's not going to be long anyway. You have found Stop the White Noise with Jonathan and Meredith. I am Jonathan. And I'm Meredith. And Stop the White News is brought to you by Mad Christianity. You can find out more about Mad Christianity at madpxm.com. Uh, get the best ooh, best newsletter on the internet, keeping you up to date with the times we live in with a little bit of uh, what wisdom and hope thrown in and spliced in. Mad Christianity is also, not Mad Christianity, Stop the White Noise is also brought to you. I'm like trying to do three things at once here. Um <laughs> By the Hebron Collegium, a gap year Bible school for men and retreat center here in Rockford, Illinois. If you need a place to get away with a couple of uh, good male friends from your church to read the Bible, to uh, ponder, to meditate, and to converse, uh, consider checking us out. Uh, And even more so, if you're a young man with a a little bit of a question about what you should be doing in life. Well, before you go and spend 30 grand a year on that BA from whatever, you know, collegiate institution you want to go to, um, why don't you consider coming up here for a month or three or maybe a year, uh, spend some time in the scriptures, spend some time with other young men asking the same questions and trying to discern the what, what wisdom. Uh, This morning's readings Mm -hmm. in the Hebrew lectionary, uh, Proverbs 4, verse 1 through 9. uh, My son, get Get wisdom. wisdom. Get wisdom. Yeah, above all things. And so uh, we'd love to have you here for a visit or for a longer amount of time. HebrewCollegium.com. And you can, of course, reach out to me through that website as well for more information. So, yeah, uh, 50th episode. We got uh, your questions. Bible answers are nonsense coming your way. Uh, in the your questions this week, uh, inside baseball, uh, it is it's a lot of intra Lutheran kind of questioning. Oh, yeah. yeah. Which That's is yeah, right, right. why are Lutherans so focused on small things? Um, they're not bad things, uh, but they are um, they are Lutheran things to be sure. And um, I wish I could. I wish when I said that they are Lutheran things, it was a good thing. It was like, yay. Right. That's I good. wish that's what we were known for is is good things. But we tend to be uh, known for mountains out of molehills, I mm-hmm. think. Um, and the sad thing is then when we actually call out a mountain, nobody believes us. Yeah, possibly. Yeah, yeah I, I think so. I'm, I'm pretty confident the Augsburg Confession, like its articles of faith, are mountainous things. They're not small things. Um, But when we uh, then go and try to regulate dogmatically everybody's understanding of everything ever, um, that that tends to diminish the value of of the real dogmatics, uh, the Mm -hmm. real things that we know are truth that never change and and all that. So, um, yeah, 
makes me think of a book I'm reading this week, but I'm not going to bring it up just yet. Uh, it, doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't really apply. I just, it, it's an interesting, an interesting study. Well, I, I can bring it up in this way. Um, it's called The Structure of Lutheranism. It's by a guy named Werner Ehlert. He uh, is a previous century, 1800s, 1900s, Lutheran thinker uh, of a body that eventually became part of the ELCA. But at the time that he's writing, he's definitely in the the biblical conservative Lutheran camp of, of the body that he's in. Um, but the the structure of Lutheranism, or I would rename the book, The Impact of the Gospel, is is really the question like, what, why? Why, why Lutheran? Lutheran. Why? Why that? What? What is that? Yeah. And he, uh, he it is interesting because always the question then becomes about, well, who's Dr. Luther? Mm -hmm. It doesn't become about who's Jesus. Right. Right. And this is like the the curse, the ghost, the haunted reality of, of being Lutherans is we've got this um, this other very important man of history who was faithful and wise in many ways, who has become larger than himself. Yeah. And and kind of hovers over us. So anyway, that I didn't, didn't really need to take us in that direction. I can recommend the book for pastors out there. Um I don't know if I recommend that one for lady. It is it is crunchy. It is crunchy. You got to you got to love your philosophy to read that one. Um and some guys do. So um Yeah. Well, that's good that you're diving into it gleaning what you can from it i'm, I'm picking at it I, it's one of those ones that's like this thick too oh, so no. you know it's this is i don't when i read a book that's this thick i don't plan to read it through without Two pausing Two inches yeah. for you who are listening yeah i uh i try to read it through uh with like a one to three year reading plan whereas i'm gonna i'm gonna come back to it you know, okay take a big chunk today so i read a big chunk of it yesterday you know i may come back once in the next week but then I'm going to go back to other works that I know I can get done sooner so I don't get bogged down and end up feeling really uh, overweighted by it. Plus, I, it gives you time to process it. I mean, when it's that complex. That's true. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to I want to think about what I read. And that doesn't mean I sit there. I'm going to think about it. I just I'm going to let it sit in the psyche for a while and, and then come back to it. Yeah. So. So I have a bunch of note cards here from this week. I don't even know what they say. I just threw everything I wrote that I didn't have a plan for in a box. Um, what do you What do you want to talk about before I just take us into random? Um, well, I was thinking about some different things this week as I, I, I had kind of a, an awkward week. It was emotionally, it was so good. There was so much yeah. good in my week that um, I praise God for, but... At the same time, I feel like it's just so when you have when you have so much good um, evils right there trying to um, either either I don't know maybe it's not evil maybe it's just the discipline of the Lord but there's also struggle mm -hmm. alongside of it. It's like you can't get too high on that mountaintop. <laughs> Um, so we had welcome week at the Hebron Collegium, which was so fabulous. It was. It was really good. Welcome week means that we eat breakfast and dinner over at the Hebron Collegium, our family does, with the students. And then I'm over there um, for a good chunk of the day, just kind of showing the, the guys what it means to do accomplish the tasks that are written on the weekly chore the daily chore and then the monthly chore list because a part of the hebron collegium isn't you move into the dorm and somebody else cares for the property it's you're going to learn some home economics here right. you're going to be part of caring for the facility and the property that's why it's not costing you forty thousand dollars a year that's so just, right. no, that's not why it costs 40000 Someone's <laughs> making money on that. You just got to know. So anyway. like we got the windows washed inside and out, and that was so fun. You know, there were parts of the windows that were really tall, and I was like, you know what? We'll get them next month. It's okay because that's a monthly task. Mm -hmm. And the guys were full of gusto and were like, no, no, no. I'll climb on your shoulder. Not me. But like they climbed on each other's oh, wow. backs and did the high windows. So our windows look great. <laughs> that's that's amazing. <laughs> um, another another fun thing that they did was um, I was cooking a birthday gift for a friend. Mm -hmm. I was making meatballs, and I had a can of tomato paste that I needed just a few scoops of this tomato paste to go into my meatball recipe. Um, and uh, 
We don't have a can opener. Our can opener, our personal Fisk family can opener actually broke. Again. Again. Like we cannot keep can openers. Can openers last for like a year. <laughs> It's ridiculous. This is, you want to talk about the, the declining quality of American goods. It's odd because yeah. like that was always the one tried and true like tool in my mother's kitchen that we moved so many times as a kid and like always had the same. It was over. always the same to the point where the handles, they probably were like this nice almond color when they were purchased, but then they got like stained reddish you know when rubber gets kind of yeah yeah kind of stained by what's what is around it anyway our can openers are not so faithful as my mother's can opener from however many years ago 40 years ago but anyway cheap goods are cheap that's what i know we don't have a can opener and i didn't even think about it when i started the recipe so i told the guys and they wanted to help me open this can and i said all right well i know there's a way there's a way to open a can. Um, go into the computer room and look it up on the internet and then come back and we'll do it. Well, there's a spoon trick where you can like rub the spoon on. Cans are made of soft metal and you can rub a metal spoon on the, the lid of a uh, of the can. And then this it is wears crazy to me. this I don't, I don't hole. believe this. I've done it. It wears a hole in t- the, the lid and then you can use the can to kind of like cut around or not the can the spoon Spoon. you use the spoon to cut around the can and you cut with the spoon you cut metal with the spoon with metal and um so they were trying it and they got a little frustrated and tired and so (laughs) this whole story okay before you tell them what they did this whole story reminds me of some cartoon i saw once upon a time i don't remember who it could have been garfield but i don't think so it's a cat and this cat has a can of cat food yeah. And there's no, there's no That's can opener. That's from Sesame Street. Is that what it is? I he's that. like banging his face on the can. I mean, he's doing anything he can to get into yeah. this can. Um, <laughs> well, apparently he just didn't have a uh, a lock bolt cutter. Exactly. So, <laughs> so I sent the guys out. I'm like, okay, if you're frustrated by the spoon, maybe a chisel will work. Go out into the threshing floor, which is the the name that we have for. Where we have the tools and the um, auto mechanic shop and the um, and the jujitsu jujitsu and gym we- workout space facility will be yeah, out there yeah. once we get the floors all done and such. Anyway, so they go out and look for a chisel because I it's you know a chisel has more of a knife edge, mm-hmm. and they come back with bolt cutters. <laughs> I mean, it's so boy. I love it. I love having boys. So thank you, mothers out there who are allowing me to adopt your sons for five seconds of their life because this is so fun. So they come back with bolt cutters and I'm like, all right, so if you just maybe bolt cut the can in half, like that's my daughter and I were thinking they're just going to cut it in half because that's what we would do. They're not big enough for that though. So they... (laughs) So they take it around the lid and they bolt cut around the lid and then pry it open. Like this is the most dangerous can ever. Yes. The end result though, I'm so proud of them. And they were so proud. They took pictures and shared them with their friends and their family. It was so cute. Did they do that? Did they only do that in the room? Yeah. No, they're like, can I have the can so that I can go into the computer and phone room? (laughs) We only allow phones and computers in one space of the house. And um, so Ramath Lahi. I remember, remembered it finally. Ramath Lahi. Ramath Lahi, the donkey's jaw. So that's where they're allowed to do computer research and um, and telephone calls or texting. Um, so they take the can and they take pictures and share it. And after I was done using it, I washed it out and baked it in the sun a little bit to kind of get the last remains of the tomato paste. And um, yeah, that's going to be our vase for a little while. <laughs> Most dangerous vase ever. Yes. Just like crack some glass off the top of your vase and like <laughs> set it out. Right. Don't touch these I wonder flowers. if you were to like, um, if you were to like Mod Podge it, if that would like uh, kind of seal coat the edges a little bit in Perhaps a way that would. if we did some soldering. Prevent the or... rust, the rusty death from, yeah. from being beneath the flower. Of course. What is a rose without thorns? It I would, know, yeah, right? Right, right. So right. anyway, that was our moment of victory. But then there was a time when I was at Walmart and I was in the school supplies. So oh. I was like, oh, that's kind of gross. 
Good. We were talking about feet being exposed this morning. I had more thoughts about that. Go ahead, though. Um, I was at Walmart in the school supplies section, and there was a family, um, a mother and two daughters, and the one daughter was sweetly asking the mother, may I have this? Mm -hmm. And the other daughter came in to the conversation very rudely and abruptly and just smashed her sister. Mm. Like, not just, no, you don't need that, but like, you don't need that and you're so worthless and why don't you ever get a job and all this stuff. And it so these just, aren't little kids. These are no, old. they were like in college. Maybe the one was in high school and the one was in college. I mean, it was like ridiculous mm. how this one daughter was treating the other. And then the mother was siding with the mean daughter and it was like, oh my goodness, you're giving your child CPTSD right <laughs> now. Like, stop. Wow. I didn't say anything. I actually walked out of the aisle. Yeah. And then <laughs> I'm going to start to cry. And then I started to cry like at Walmart because I was so sad that this poor girl is growing up and she was like, I'd really like to get a job. I'd like to make my own money. I'd I'd want to get a car, you know, like trying to tell these mm -hmm. people in her family, I want to improve myself. Mm. And there, and she goes, but I just don't know how. And all they did was tell her how worthless she was. That's very sad. It was so awful. So anyway, that was my Walmart experience for the week. Um, I feel like I had another happy experience, but, but then, So how do we get to that one from, you, you transitioned it just, into that. I just transitioned. Oh, okay. It was just a cold, hard break. Okay. From to, my amazing it wasn't, it wasn't so cold and hard. It was a pretty, this is a pretty <laughs> uh, hot and, and, and struggly, sharp, bitey. Yeah, it was bitey, awful. And then bruisey. do you know, do you know what happened? And it, the, I don't even know what to say about this because you don't want to be mystical and weird, but like. The song that came on was Lauren Daigle's Hold On To Me, where Aww. it's talking about how, like, when you can't do it on your own, Christ is there lifting you up and carrying you. And I just, I was really thankful for that reminder. But I was so sad for the girl because of, you know, walking through your experiences with you, with CPTSD and knowing how devastating it is. Not just to the person at the moment, but to all the people that then gonna she's going to have a relationship with, with mm -hmm. and yeah. how devastating it is for generations to come, you know, if she's going to not take the time to overcome it and face it and work against yeah. it. Yeah. But she had such a, um, such desire and such a sweetness to her in just those few minutes that I observed her. And it was, um, it was heartbreaking. Hmm. So, yep. So that was my Walmart. Experience. Why do you like that Lauren Daigle song? What does it say? Um, it t talks about like uh, when you don't feel strong, when you don't feel um, like you're enough, when you just feel trodden upon, he, Christ, is lifting you up and unfortunately it doesn't actually say christ mm -hmm. at all but it's on an album that does say christ and and is christian and so you can assume if you're a a fan and kind of know right who she is but she's actually made it to the mainstream to that because, level of cool where you yeah. can no longer say the name of jesus to be popular right kind of well so the amy she, grant track right so she's very much so the Christian Amy Grant, like the, uh, what am I trying to say? Today's Christian youth's Amy Grant. Right. Um, right. So other radio stations are picking her up. Um, and I mean, yeah, she's definitely a Baptist. So buyer beware. But I like it because it does remind me. Honestly, when we were in the thick of your discovery of CPTSD, I had stopped listening to country music mm -hmm. because, um, and at one point you even asked me, you're like, why don't you listen to country music anymore? And I said, honestly, I need a little bit less romance and a little more truth. Mm -hmm. And Lauren Daigle was the one that I listened to first. Like I just um, came across her, I think 
possibly because I saw her face at Hobby Lobby because hmm. she has albums yeah, right. that are for sale there. Right. <laughs> and so I was like, hmm, who is this cute little girl with her hair wraps and her beads all over? Chloe and I had an interesting conversation because so. we do have Caleb on on the radio a lot. Um, and uh, uh, you guys leave it on. And so it's on when I get in and <laughs> yeah. I will I will let it run. And I, I am... I don't know. Uh, Generally, the music, I'm kind of, having been away from Christian, popular Christian music, Christian radio music, please, anyone who's listening, I'm not talking about what you do in church right now. Like, none of this belongs in church. But like, this is instead of listening to Kenny Chesney in the car. Correct. (laughs) People who are like promoting like some entertaining music that has a Christian worldview, supposed. Mm Mm-hmm. The most joyful thing about it for me has been finding out just how how it isn't nearly as bad as I thought it was. Right. Like I I I was ready I'm I started listening like ready to just not be able to listen, to be like, this is so wrong. Yeah. And what I've found instead is that, yeah, I mean, there's edges, there's pieces, but um golly, I wish Lutherans had that much hope. Yeah. I wish Lutherans had that much trust. I wish they cared that much about God, like instead of going home to watch the game. Um, and it's not all Lutherans, don't get me wrong. But like I've been really um, so pleasantly surprised by it. And then so so it's on in the car. And so uh, we were Chloe and I were driving to uh, Jiu Jitsu uh, probably on Thursday, might have been Tuesday. And uh, um, the, the song came on. I don't know who the artist is, but it's like, I pray the name of Jesus over you. <laughs> yes. Pray blessings down that... upon you. I pray, pray prosperity gospel all over you. Do you remember the Louisiana Baptist Church we went to? Did they actually say that, that? was the prayer song. Yeah. Like, we're going to pray now, congregation. And then that was what we did. Was so, sing that song. And Chloe goes like, <laughs> she's like, I don't know what to do with this song. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, right, exactly. I do too, because it led to a really good conversation. And I, and the thing is, like, if you know the prosperity gospel, you can like hear it all the way through oh, the song. Yeah, You're exactly. like, this this carries with it a spirit that should make you feel a little bit uncomfortable if you're a grace alone Christian. That said, it never actually says anything wrong. Right. Not once. And to realize that to, to to not reject praying the name of Jesus over my own life because someone else does it wrong is a really important thing to realize that to say to someone who's struggling, well, let's pray to Jesus. Let's call in the name of the almighty God yeah. to whom every knee shall bow and believe the blessings will come. Like you don't have to assume the blessings are health, wealth, and eternal prosperity. You can, you can believe the blessings are whatever God gives, which will include family, friends, community, life together, you know, um, yeah. Daily bread, right? Um, uh, it, it, true wealth, wisdom, right? Uh, and so, um, we had a, we had a great conversation about that. And I and I told her like when I when I hear this song, like I turn it down, I don't turn it up. But I also remember, I mean, even as I'm driving anywhere, I, I remember to pray to Jesus. Hmm. And I think, well, whatever she's singing, I want the true version. Right. I want the true version. And I I really think there's a place for that. I mean, I guess you need to have your theology, your knowledge of God sharpened to be able to do that with these songs. I mean, the the danger, this is such a Lutheran thing. Well, somebody might get it wrong. And then if someone gets it wrong, (laughs) then everything will go wrong forever and ever and ever. And like we live in fear, hoarding the treasure in the sand. And and it it um, it has not gone well for the spirituality of our of our places. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and, and. I mean, this is, I guess, another just shout out here. Like, all right, you who want to critique this stuff, what are you going to make instead? When are we going to get busy doing something? Right? Well, and some people have said, you know, let's turn on LPR, Lutheran Public Late Radio, or let's listen to some hymns or whatever. I just, there's such a formality to it. Yeah. I just don't get Let me in get the, really serious while I drive like, and worship God. Like, like I want oh, to worship God when I hear people. that. Somebody, yeah, why don't you put on Bach, really get on right? As if Bach just does it. Funny. And that's great. You know what? If that's what you 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 gets you going, um, lots of people don't get going on that. This isn't. I'm not at church in my car. 
Yeah, I I'm love not. those hymns at church. I love, I even love them when they come on, like when Chloe's practicing the piano or Alleluia is practicing the piano and it's like, oh, yay. But um, if I'm going to switch from listening to Florida Georgia Line to something that's going to keep me focused, I'm not going to be like, you know what I need? I need the LPR choir <laughs> right now. <laughs> That's going to fill I that just, niche. I'm, this is not a dig at LPR. This is a dig no, at the world that produces that music. No, I'm saying what I'm about to say um, oh. is a dig at the world. That, they, they just don't record it well. I mean, honestly, the recordings are just not that great. The The quality of the of the stuff isn't that great. And if you want to get critique about text, you can get just as critique about some of the texts that are in that stuff. So I was recently talking about this to somebody and they mentioned that like the organ just is not a recordable instrument no it's not it's a it live does, instrument yes. like if you go to a con an organ concert fab if you then take a recording home <laughs> it's like the live it's like the live you not know you, the you, same. Get, you get a, a recording of a rock band and it's their live recording yeah. like it it yeah no it doesn't. you gotta love that rock band <laughs> you gotta already know all the songs like you're not gonna be like wow this is great I turn it up you know it's <laughs> yeah. not gonna happen and so um, it's the same thing with the organ. Um, the organ is a very, very unique instrument. And I'll even say at a certain point, it's not even that great to sing to, depending. Yeah. I mean, you got to know how to play it. Yeah. What was the song last week? Ugh, I don't even know. Was it from Depths of Woe I Cry to You? Oh, yeah. Was that it? I think it might have I don't have think been. it was, though. Okay, because it was the end. So our, our musician at St. Paul is incredible we love he's, him he we love you can't gloriously gifted. yes <laughs> gloriously gifted um and he i said this to him yes last week too after first service and then he outdid himself second service like it was even better i said you have a way of making every sunday feel like a high feast day and i never know it's coming mm -hmm. i don't expect it and then all of a sudden i'm like surrounded by the choirs of angels and archangels you know so i <laughs> got i got like us. true confessions on this one so and he uses a grand piano too and he he moves between the piano and organ and really in one song amazing play yeah. different verses on different instruments okay it was, this was a, not what i was going to say okay, but, you know, so yeah he'll start <laughs> the song that we don't really even know that well maybe on the piano no it has to be we know it better it's a song we know well on the piano that we kind of want to sing harmony to. And so then he'll stop like at verse three and it'll be a cappella, and we're all singing harmony. And then the organ comes in for verse yeah. four and it's just like, ah! it's so, it's so amazing. Um, no, but it, it, whether it was from depths of all I cry to you or a different one, it was one of these like old Lutheran hymns that isn't easy. If you don't know it, it, it yeah. takes some, some work to know this hymn. Um, St. Paul's an amazing singing congregation in, in general, especially for our size and for being in a carpeted a frame. <laughs> um, it really, it really does well. But, uh, so, so to like finish the story, I have to go kind of true confessions. Oh. Son of an organist too, by the way. The organ does not move me. <laughs> You're forgiven. <laughs> I I actually kind of hate it personally. Right. The reason for this is because it it doesn't move. Like you you cannot be that good at piano and you just go do 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 and I'm gonna be like, oh <laughs> right. You start playing the organ, even if you're good, I'm just kinda like, yeah, it's organ. And I can tell the difference between bad and good. I can be like, I respect this. I see I see how hard it is. You're using your feet. That's nuts. <laughs> like, I, I get it. Oh, and it, and it can overpower a congregation of 500 people so that they can all hear it. And, and I, I get it. I get all the reasons why organ is great. Nonetheless, it has never, ever moved me until that song last week. Mm -hmm. I'm delivering communion and I'm hearing him play. I'm hearing everyone sing. And I'm like, this is the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, and then and then he followed up with Come That Font on uh, on uh, piano right afterward, which yeah. oh, I just want to weep. Oh, so yeah. good. Right. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Yeah. All that from Caleb. Yeah. Caleb. <laughs> so, yeah. Shout out there. Yeah. Um, so we had another. So like my emotional week, my highs and my lows continued. And I was listening, I was listening to Caleb as I was picking the kids up from, um, 
from jujitsu. And there's a podcast done by uh, Rebecca St. James. I don't mm. know if you remember her from our. our I, I do. She's not my favorite. Christian not my favorite music style. Days. Yeah. I'm, what her brother's got going on, I, I kind of like. What is it? King and Country? Is that what his no, no, name no, no, is? No, 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 no. Isn't he? No, no, no. Something different. He's, Who he, is I he? thought he had this name, and it's kind of like. Anyway, I don't know. It's not King and Country. It's something else. It's like King and Country. Yeah. It's a similar style. I like him better than King and Country. Yeah. He's the one who sings that one about um, walking through the fire. Yeah. Um, God, it's a great song. Um, anyhow, their mother has a podcast called something, Mum Something. Anyway, on it, they invite, they, they focus on marriage. And I was like, oh, I should listen to this and see what they say if there's anything I can glean from it. And in the commercial, one of the husbands, so they invite their husbands onto the show for this marriage um series series, and um one of the the husbands says she believed in me when i didn't believe in myself (laughs) sorry here you go again and then (laughs) and then they go on to say that like oh there i am you're back you're back (laughs) they go on to say that um women want to be cherished and when they are they show that it's easier for them to show their respect that they have for Mm -hmm. their husband Mm -hmm. when they feel cherished and i thought wow that's such a great concept to talk about on our show i don't know how i don't know how we could talk about that but i put it on a note card and then i just kind of put it in my bag (laughs) and then like the next day you and I had this big um, discussion mm. evening, one of those fun discussion evenings that we have sometimes where we have like a miscommunication and then we have to work through it. Mm-hmm. And and it was totally like the summary of it was I just wanted to feel cherished mm-hmm. and you just wanted to be respected mm-hmm. in the end. Mm-hmm. And once we were able to say like, because you had said at one point um, that you you felt or your concern was or your issue was that you felt that I was um, not proud of you, or I said I I felt I I I'd, I'd given my all that night yeah for the community right and it wasn't good enough wasn't good enough. Because I hadn't seen you in spaces throughout the night enough to have you feel cherished. Right. Even though from where I sat, I had been very intentional about talking about what you did to you at moments and saying thank you for it. Um, yeah. But it was, there was too much, right? And this is the thing about when you're active it's very easy to then um, not, and I, I'm a chief center here, to not hear the cherishing that, that someone says, right? Like, so I'm a chief center in terms of like, like you'll say this, 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 and then later on I'm like, you never say this, right? Right. 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 So that's where I would, that's what I felt at that point in the night then being, being when, when what you wanted was a hug, what you wanted was for me at that moment to actually just go above and beyond and, and yeah. Relish you. So right? like what ha- what the, the the issue that kind of flipped it all on its head and made the ice cream hit the fan that night was <laughs> That's a in, in a in a dairy allergic household, that's a terrifying thought. I'd rather have poop up there. Golly. Was that you made a comment about some work that needed to be done and then I was trying to clarify like who who was going to do this work and and in you, your answering of it like delegating to other people you said you know if if I can delegate I will because it helps me mm-hmm. and I gave a look mm-hmm. that was like I can't do anymore and and so that was my moment of feeling of of misunderstanding like you are cherishing me 
but I don't feel cherished because I'm assuming you're speaking about me in that like, well, I don't want to do it. Somebody else will. And I just assumed I like grabbed hold of it and put it Mm. all on my own shoulders. And you had no intention of that. Well, I'm going to I'm going to say based on what I was responding to, because in my memory, you had asked, what else do we need to do? And so I was saying, we need to do this. And then you'd asked something like, um, uh, uh, are you going to do that? And I said, um, if I don't have to, I won't, right? Which doesn't mean I won't do it. It's sort of like open in, in the air. And it wasn't on my agenda for the next day to actually achieve that. And so, but I thought right. you were asking, is there more that can be achieved tomorrow? And I was like, yeah, well, this, this could be achieved. Um, but yeah, so yeah, so I wasn't really putting it on your shoulders, but I was saying, if you want to take it, you can, right? But you heard it as do more. Yeah. Like, I don't want to do it. I don't, I, you do it. (laughs) And so I felt, I put myself in a position with poor hearing of um, not being cherished. And Mm. so essentially we went around and around and rehashed and did all the things you're not supposed to do in our in your conversations when you're in a disagreement and you're married um, or you have a significant relationship. And then finally the end was just that all I needed to say to you for your emotions was I cherish or I value what you're doing. You're doing enough. Mm -hmm. There's no more that you need to do and I am proud of you. And all that I needed was for you to say like i see that you've had a hard week i see that you've had a hard day and i love you i just have that moment of cherishing and once we were able to get there it was fine it was done it was over Mm -hmm. it was like really that took an hour and a half to just say that or to figure that out to figure out that you wanted respect and i needed cherishing and so when i thought about it the next day it was kind of like oh my goodness the lord gave me an example Hmm. of exactly watch what you ask for amen (laughs) that's a fun one exactly what i was hoping to have an example of or speak more to Hmm. on the show so yeah not what i thought i had been praying for but i think it's good in the end yeah I mean, and what I'm what I'm pondering here is like, so how how do you teach a man to cherish his wife? And the uh, the thought that then is is there is well, um, figuring out how she receives love, i.e., love languages, is is kind of important in that. Um, because as I think back to that night, what there was not was as many opportunities to to touch. So. Um, We've just le- I've just learned last week from you <laughs> that you and value, I just learned last month you, <laughs> that you value um, being uh, being touched right yeah. not not in a sexual way necessarily although in marriage that happens but but just um, a hug uh, a rub on the back yeah. uh, a moment holding hands and because of the activity of that day we had basically not we didn't even see each other until passed. like two we sat by each other at dinner. Yeah. And there was kind of a moment there, but it, but I was teaching because guys yeah. are talking. And so, you know, you were not the focus at all. Um, and uh, and so if I think back to, you know, what would have made you feel more cherished that day? It would have been when I arrived at the house, go over and rub your back or, or give you a hug or just like trying the to. the eye contact moment of how are you doing? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, taking that, that time to really check in deeply not just like hey how are you doing and then move on but how are you um but conversely like how do you train people well i don't know that you can actually train a boy the reason i'm saying this is because you know people are listening right they're the good men are like well how do i cherish my wife like (laughs) it's like what do i do what do i do right well and i mean diving into finding out how she receives love best there are Supposedly, there are five different ways that people receive love, and one of them is physical touch. 
Um, one of them is affirming words. Mm-hmm. One of them is gifts. Another is acts of service. And the other one is quality time. So finding out how she actually feels the the most loved when she receives love in this way right. is a good thing. Yeah. But then doing the, all five of them is a good thing. We all need all five of them. Yeah. So in a marriage, you actually do want to quality time. You want to set aside time for that date experience. You don't have to go out to eat. Um, for the longest time, you and I have dated just by having like wine at home or by um, those 30 minutes before bed where we're just checking in, making eye contact, yeah. talking about the day, what was concerning, what wasn't. Um in a marriage, we both need affirming words. Wow, I really love how you did this. I can't wait to see what you're going to do next. You know, those those upbuilding words. We all need physical touch. We need hugs. We need back rubs. We need the hand holding. Like some people say, don't ever stop holding hands. Like how did you make it 57 years in your marriage? Well, mm. we never stopped holding hands. Um, and then we've also looked through... Um, different marriage books and some of them had said if you're in a an argument to hold hands because you can't yell at somebody that you're connected to physically like in that manner um it just will help you to guard your speech a little bit more um so your words will not be as harsh so as physical touch um little gifts who doesn't like having, <laughs> opening their group briefcase and finding a little note that says, I yeah, love you. Yeah, it's always really nice when you do you that. You know? <laughs> you did that when I went on the Higher Things trip. I, I did. Yeah. 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 Um, and then the acts of service. Like, that's huge. Yeah, the tough one with that Feeling. is when it's like, that's all that you do is acts of service, right? And like, so like, I don't, you don't, I would imagine for you to try to find more acts of service would be difficult, put it that way, <laughs> Yeah. right? Like that's your I vocation. Think, I think I'm filling that quota for everybody in, in the, the home. House. Okay, yeah. you know, like, I mean, as far as I'm touching each person in that way right. because my vocation is blessed to be able to. So, but the idea, but, I guess, a little bit is is not an act of service just open-endedly, but to do something the other person needs done for them that they would have to do themselves yeah. that isn't part of the normal reality so that it's seen you went out of your way to provide for them right? and so. we read a book early on in our marriage where the couple would do little acts of service like fill up the tank in the car mm-hmm. you know not being asked just fill it up go get a car wash whatever and then they'd leave a little note and it said smiley oh i do remember See that how much I love you. Yeah. And they just do that and then put a little happy face or a heart or whatever. Mm-hmm. So S H M I L Y. See how much I love you. Yeah, I remember Smiley, but I'd forgotten it had that <laughs> meaning. Wow. And so you could do that. You could put a little note, mm-hmm. empty the trash in his cave, in his study or his den. Right. And, um, you know, it can't dust be, in his It can't cave. be what you normally do. <laughs> right. Right. Just a little thing. Um, and if you want him to know that you did it, just leave a little note. I love you. And and then he'll know. That's cool. So or she'll know. Um, just I thought you might appreciate this comment from Jane. She says, uh, I appreciate you crying. <laughs> it helps me. I have a hard time crying. You help me open up. Jane, I guess I cry for the both of us. I knocked, I bumped the wire and it knocked you out again then. But Uh oh, here I am. The sound, the sound. Yeah, I am. Unfortunately, if I start to cry, like I said last week, it just never stops. It just keeps going all day long. So, yeehaw. It's like we should give you guys a prize for whoever starts the floodgates. Oh, that's how the kids treat your birthday, isn't it? (laughs) It is. The kids have a competition to see who can make me cry. <laughs> With how sweet their With thing is. And yeah. blessedness and, and all that. Yeah. Yeah. So I never got through. I don't know if you guys know of the book, um, I'll Love You Forever. And it's about a little baby whose mother, his whole life, sings, 
I'll love you forever. I'll like you for always. As long as I'm living, your mother, you're my baby, you'll be. And so it goes through his life and all of the different phases of raising a son. And at night, she always sings that song to him while she rocks him. And I cannot get through that book. Because then at the end, she's, I think she's dying or she's sick. Mm. And he goes, and he picks her up. <laughs> he picks her up out of her bed and he rocks her. Aww. And he says, I'll love you for all. I'll love you forever. I'll like you for always. As long as I'm living. As long as you're living. No, he flips it. As long as I'm living, your, your baby. Baby I'll be, I'll be or yeah. something. Yeah. And it's just so sweet. And the kids. <laughs> I'm thinking of Goodnight Dune at the moment, which is a different book entirely. Good, good night, Gamja Bar. So I sit there and I'm raining down upon the kids and they're all like, oh, mother. And now none of them can read it without crying. crying. That's funny. <laughs> even even uh, our, our son? Um, I think, well, you know, honestly, I don't think he has read it. I don't think he's like sought it out to read had, it. Yeah, right. He's it's not probably, really it's that. It's too much for it's him. It's not really it's like, his I thing. Don't, I don't need that right now. <laughs> Don't need that right now. No, I'm okay. I'm going to go listen to uh, Africa, rock and roll style. Right. Uh, uh, anyhow, so thanks, Jane. Mm, so mm, that was mm. it. That's all I have. That's my collection. And then we were talking about feet this morning. Oh, yeah. I don't know if we need to follow back to that. It was just, I realized, so like this idea of, okay, so... In the Hebrew lectionary, if you read this morning, Joshua met the angel of the commander of the Lord's armies, which is probably Jesus. And um, the guy's like, take your feet off, boy. Like Your shoes, yeah. Take your feet off. Take your feet off. <laughs> take your shoes off. Amputation. Shout yeah. out for Drew. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, are, uh, um, you are in you're on holy ground. And so the question came up like, why don't we take our shoes off at church? Church is holy ground. And it, it like, well, what's the real point here? The real point's respect. And at this point in our society, you would be showing disrespect to take your shoes off at church because your stinky socking feet would, would everyone would look at them and be like, why are your shoes off? And in fact, yeah. I've done this with sandals and people do look at me funny when I'm sitting there barefoot, um, just in my flip flops. So, um, barefoot though. So like when Joshua took off his sandals, he would not have had socks on. So I think there would be a significant, I, I'm convinced there's a, there would be, even in American society, if you were at church and you're like, I'm going to take my shoes off to go up to communion uh -huh. and you left your socks on, people would be like, <laughs> if you went up absolutely barefoot, they'd be like, right. Yeah. And so the faces I made was one was kind of a sneer and one was sort of like a confusion, yeah. right. And I really think that would be different, that, that the socks themselves are still shoes. And so the, it's got to that a whole idea, like you're on holy ground. Maybe it's not take your shoes off because the shoes are bad. Maybe take your shoes off because the ground is good and you want your skin to touch the good because proximity is holiness and holiness is proximity. Ah, so it's like early <laughs> communion. I guess so. I was thinking you know, of it more like, like grounding. Testament. I loved your like, face. Like, you were like, what did you do? Well, that was like a Lutheran face. What did you just say? <laughs> there's, a, there's a question about communion infants today. So, oh. um, <laughs> no, I mean like. I was thinking it's like, it's like holy, holy grounding. Like, yeah. so you, know, you, you do grounding because you're going to like discharge bad electrons into the earth and all this. Yeah. And we don't do enough of that in theory. I don't, I don't know if it's true, but I do like to put my feet on the grass sometimes. Um, so it's like that only the other way. Right. Like you're going to get holy from this ground. Like, like take your shoes off. I'm about to send you into war. Like this is going to fill you up here. Come on. Right. And so in that regard, take eat. Exactly. Is the actual fulfillment of this. Not take yeah. your shoes off, but take eat. Yeah. Right. Uh, take drink. This is holy. So, yeah. I mean, I there have just been questions like you and I were married barefoot because we did a foot washing ceremony. And so... Um, which I, I think it was sweet. I like it. I like the picture that you put up recently. I'm, I'm like, oh, look how, look how little we were. <laughs> Teeny. Yeah. I mean, phys physical, like wise, we're actually both the same. I'm a little, maybe I bigger. I'm, I'm definitely broader than I was. Um, but my face our, seemed our, we were so little babies. Tiny. Our baby just, faces. Just, just 
Yeah. Youthful. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so we were barefoot throughout the ceremony, not just for mm-hmm. for that portion. And um, and then recently there was a a wedding where that was not something that the groom was excited about at all. And so I was like, oh, it gave me pause. About barefoot being barefoot? barefoot. To a point where it was seen as disrespectful. Like, no, why would we do something so disrespectful? I see. And so... That's my point, though, is that culturally then, again, yeah, to have your shoes off is disrespectful. And Unless you're asked to do it when you enter the home, in which point then you do it. But if you ever notice, when you do that, you're kind of like really hyper aware of your feet. Right. Because in our culture, to be barefoot is disrespectful. To be to not have shoes is disrespectful. Yeah. Right. And I was telling the guys, so we were reading the lectionary readings, the Hebron lectionary readings together with the boys across the street this morning as we ate breakfast. And I was, t- I was kind of confessing, like, I do have a thing where if I see somebody, if I know someone, and then suddenly we're going to go swimming together. Like, I've known you for six months, and then we decide to go swimming. And I see your feet bare for the first time. It's almost like, oh my goodness, that's too much. Mm-hmm. You know, I have a, this weird moment of like, you have just revealed a very intimate part of your body, which is strange to me because it's not intimate. It's your foot. <laughs> but, but it is because we cover our them. Our culture we is cover them. so shoe oriented mm-hmm. Yeah. that, yeah. So I was thinking also about this in that, so like in the ancient world, um, if you came to my home, which had a dirt floor, okay, you wouldn't take your shoes off to walk on the dirt floor, but I might offer you a seat near somewhere where there's a rug and I would offer you a basin of water as a gift and a welcome so that you might wash your feet. And that would have been normal in all but the poorest of society. Like everyone Th- okay. This would be hospitality. Jesus says, "One, like I came in your house and you didn't offer me water for my feet." Like right. that was that was rude, actually, to not do that to me, right? And so, that's the world Joshua was living in, yeah. right? I mean, it's a thousand years before Jesus, but that's the world Joshua was living in, uh, wherein um, to take your shoes off and wash your feet is is uh, a sign of of hospitality and welcome, and. We just, we just don't have that. Isn't it weird though? Like our shoe in, in theory, our feet should be like cleaner and nicer. We do all this stuff to, and, yeah. and, and, and instead it's, they've turned into like a faux pas. It is, it is kind of odd. Well, but then it's certain times. So that's in the fall, in the winter, but then right now in the year up here in the Northern hemisphere, <laughs> um, you know, we have hot weather so much more that seeing feet in sandals Mm -hmm. or manicure or pedicured um, toenails all the things that we during the winter neglect to do we are more vigilant about doing and so seeing a foot seeing a shoulder is less like oh yeah i see her shoulder you know because or his shoulder (laughs) because it's kind of how we survive these hot humid months so our our eyes just don't, it's not as shocking. Whereas if I were to wear um, flip-flops or sandals in December, January, February for right. sure, and you see my feet, then it would be more shocking. It would be odd because not everybody around us is doing it and you haven't seen feet for so long. Uh. So there you go. That's our foot conversation. It made me think about how like our <laughs> first our first winter here in Illinois, it was my first winter not in the International Center of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, where there was a dress code that involved no sandals, which I did not appreciate. Um, <laughs> I therefore did not wear shoes the first year. I wore I wore flip flops through the winter. I remember that. In the snow. Because as a as a matter of like I can. <laughs> because I can't. Yeah. Um, I have not done that every winter since. I do put on shoes when the snows come. Isn't it um, interesting how men? Um, it was like a big like freedom yeah. moment. Like for me, that was like like, like asserting my need, yeah. You need that. Yeah. You need that ability to assert your decision making processes. Tell me I can't wear sandals in the winter. What are you talking about? And how how do we raise our boys with an appreciation? 
Like, how do we appreciate our boys in a way that they don't feel like they have no freedom, you know? Mm -hmm. Guide them. Because the International Center's rules were such that whoever made them felt like they were just and right and Mm -hmm. good and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And we as parents lay down these rules and we do that so that it's it's just and right and good for it, the protection of our kids and, and our just friends. just trying to keep him from killing himself accidentally. Right. Most of the but time, then right? how do you how do you do that in a way that How do you give your boys room to run? Yeah. 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 It's a good question. I don't know that we do a super great job mm. of that. Oh no 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 no. We absolutely oppress boyhood. I your this wire must be going bad for you. Um <laughs> Uh, I get small commercial breaks. We oppress, breaks. <laughs> we oppress uh, boyhood and manhood. That's why they turn to video games. It's because the one place they're allowed to be, to be active, to do the things that they want to do. They're the kind of, they can leave the real world and go into their platonic dream and and experience the the masculinity, the, the testosterone. Yeah. That we've effectively said the only place you can do that is on the football field, and not all guys are like up for that especially if they spend a lifetime drinking corn syrup and watching movies. They're not really always ready yeah. to step on that field. Right. Um, and so, I mean, let the reader of carnivore diets understand the, <laughs> uh, that, that uh, so for the emasculated man who's already uh, had mm-hmm. his testosterone taken from him, uh, where can he try to emulate that spiritually? And uh, there aren't, I mean, video games is, is it, I mean, fantasy fiction and movies at a certain point become that too. I mean, it's all just kind of going into virtual reality. Like it's removing yourself platonic from dream. reality. Yep. And so my, my question kind of led me to think, so maybe as a mother, as a father, it's more important for me to examine exactly what I want to achieve, not maybe have all the rules. But really think about, like, is it worth it? Mm -hmm. (laughs) We told our son to wear shoes when he goes outside, right? So that's a pretty important one for us. We feel like we found glass around the property. Often enough, we've found rusty nails. You would think that planter's wort for a year. Well, and that's what I'm getting to. He, so they last summer, not this one, but last summer, oh, it was the one before, did he just disregarded it and he ended up with a planter's wart two of them actually got planter's warts and um and it lasted for no kidding a year and a half Mm -hmm. and it was painful and it was frustrating and he still was not wearing shoes this summer he's going back to wearing to being barefoot so it's like and i asked i did ask though okay i asked the foot doctor finally took him to a foot doctor because i was like really i might as well buy stocks in this acid stuff that I'm buying (laughs) at Walmart because, whoa, we have bought so much of it and it's still not gone. So we went to the foot doctor and he said, to be honest, like it doesn't matter if you wear, to protect yourself from planter's wart, it doesn't matter if you wear shoes or not. Um, I don't get that. It's a virus. And so you come into, well, potentially through his mouth potentially through in his foot in some other way in his hands i mean you don't know i don't know it's a virus and then it manifests itself Hmm. in that spot and so essentially your body has has pushed the virus to this one little spot on your foot Mm -hmm. to be like okay we aren't gonna deal with you anymore we're just gonna create this like yeah crest around you and you just be a virus by yourself so what you do with the acid or the freeze drying is you actually create a cut so that your body then sends the antibodies and says, "Uh oh, cut, we need to heal. And so then it will focus on killing it specifically. So as far as planter's words go, I don't know if our shoe battle is really going to help him, but you know, to step on glass or to step on metal, like that's a different story in my opinion. It's, It's to me, this whole thing has just come down to like, are you going to obey me or not? And yeah, can you learn this lesson, son, as you become a young man, as you begin to enter the phase of life in which you have some independent thinking, will you learn to submit to authority or will you be the rebel who ends up with punishment? And that's I like I think that's super important. I mean, because when you were at the IC, like you did where 
no sandals or did you end up pushing? Uh, anyway, so, so no, we don't I, have to air no, I want to tell. I want to tell. I want to tell. <laughs> like if they ever watch, which they don't, they, they can be mad about it or whatever. No, no, no. So, so I had to be in that building before anybody else in the world because I had to start stuff up at six o'clock in the morning. Okay. So nobody else was there for like two hours. So I would, I would wear sandals in and carry a pair of shoes into the studio. I'd do the first hour and a half in my sandals. And then before anybody showed up, I'd put on shoes and throw my sandals in my bag just so I could show how it made, it made no difference in what I did yeah. sitting behind a desk doing radio, what was on my feet. Well, and then the funny thing is, is that women could wear sandals. Like that was weird. That was very, yes. They had to have a heel strap. Cause that too. You can buy men's sandals with heel straps too. And then that you can't wear jeans except on Fridays. That's casual day. But the whole point of this is that we're not supposed to ever look casual so that like when people come in, they think we're professional. So why are you doing casual? Blah, 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 blah. So, so the point that I'm trying to make then with bringing that up again is like how much you definitely want to teach your son to respect authority. Have and to. you have to. have to. You hate him if you don't. Um, and also because as someday an authoritarian or a person who's in authority, you know, he is going to want respect shown to him. And so do unto others as you would like done unto you, right? Um, but then you also want to choose your battles maybe as parents and not and not control him so tightly that he's in a box and feels trapped. Because Which, that, as it, you demonstrated with yeah. wearing sandals all winter in the snow, like... It was awesome. It's not always... <laughs> well, it was cool because you didn't slip on ice. God be praised. I was more careful. <laughs> I honestly was because I didn't want my feet to get wet. Yeah. And so I was, I was more careful than I would have been even in boots. I thought about every step that I took. I think, um, I mean, for, for our, our own sake here, um, our son has a good deal of freedom compared to average boys. Um, he has an acre plus to frolic on. Um, he has a, a bike jump that he built for the BMX. <laughs> and then proceeded to like totally pop his tire and not. And I love it because he learns the consequences of his actions, but then he doesn't learn them. He just lives through them and then does it again and again and again. I don't know if that's. That's boy. That's very boy. And I don't know how many times you guys have to learn or live through consequences in order to learn. So while you're young, you'll just keep trying. <laughs> And then age happens and you learn to question what you did and you try differently next time. And yeah. then more age comes and you decide to, to see that like this is so different or this is this is so not possible. I'm not going to do that again. Yeah. Right. I, I don't plan to buy a uh, used car warranty Ugh. again. Yeah. <laughs> This is a trick. We'll leave this story for some, some other time. <laughs> but uh, hey, those of you uh, who like what we do, if you would like to support us, uh, patreon.com slash revfisk or subscribestar.com slash revfisk. Um, yeah, I, I lost I lost some money this week. I was stolen from. So not that that's why you should support us, but maybe I'll just <laughs> kind of like like pull at your heartstrings here. It's like, you know, we watch the fists all the time. Maybe we could throw them five bucks a month. Like, well, come on, come on, throw us five <laughs> bucks a month. Or those of you who are, I love on, on subscribe star, there's like these tiers. And like, I think at super fan, you're giving us $80 a month. Oh, I thought you said like, we're talking about crying tears. I no mean, tears, like T-I-E-R-S. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you got like, you know, fan and like subscriber fan, super fan, right? Yeah. So that's like 20 bucks a show is is 80 bucks a month right wow. right so so we have we have about four of those maybe five of wow, those guys, um, and thank then you. there's a category called you're probably crazy we have one person oh crazy. thank you we have thank one person you, who's crazy. probably crazy um so uh actually there's someone else who gives about that much via paypal as well so wow. but but so two two crazy people that think what we're doing is worth it um want to help us with the the trials of life today's reading from luke 12 in hebron collegium you know do not store up treasure where moth and rust destroy and where thief break in and steal um uh yeah, legalized theft a oh, man makes me angry and then i'm working on like we talked about this this morning like i need to learn how to how to be angry not to be like well don't get angry about this jonathan but instead be like no i'm angry like i don't have to do anything but i need to be angry because um they lied to me i was sold i was sold a lie 
a, a three thousand dollar lie. Yeah. And and it's just a fat fat lie, and I'm angry, and I'm going to be angry, and it's okay to be angry. And I prayed Psalm 109 against their company. <laughs> Go check it out. There's a proverb about that, right? Like like um, when when your enemy is down and broken, like don't push him down further, lest he call it to God against you, and God answer him. <laughs> Now, beware when you when you bring the prayers of the Christian against you, um, and that all the more reason for the Christian to call out uh, against his enemies using the words of the Psalter. So, um, 109, 35, yeah, 35, 69, 43. Yeah, there was a a bumper sticker with 109 on it, with regards to Psalm 109. No, 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 no. Yeah, one and I. Yeah, yeah. Let yeah. another take his office. So it's, uh, I mean, that's, it's about Judas. It's about the ungodly who reject Christ. These are your true enemies. Um, uh, but uh, it had a recognition that, you know, Biden, let, let him be removed from his office and let another take his place. Well, yeah. I mean, any person in a, in a position of authority. That's actually quoted about Jesus by Peter as they put Matthias into into his office. So that's the text that they use to say we need to put another apostle in this office, that there is an office of apostle okay. and whatnot. So um, I guess I can take the subscribe star stuff down at this point. <laughs> um, oh, I wanted to uh, – we've had uh, – I can't go back and look at all this. But we've had a bunch of hellos this morning from all over the United States, but we have also hello. had uh, hellos from the United Kingdom. And uh, oh. here's a hello from – Indonesia wow. watching at night Hi. over there. So um, thank you for joining us uh, from, from Indonesia. Uh, what a and treat. I did learn that Stop the White Noise uh, has been listened to this year in over 25 countries. So um, wow. that's not YouTube, that's Transistor, that's the, okay. the podcast version. But in my experience, you know, probably 10 of those countries were one and someone just clicked on one or it's even a bot or something. But Oh, interesting. But, um, okay. Uh, but that's a lot of places yeah yeah so it's exciting um yeah so today or not today this week you mentioned getting off of twitter in the wednesday bible study and i was so excited for you that i like <laughs> almost stood up and started clapping and then you said almost you were like i got off of twitter and so i was like yeah and then use it almost. And I was like, oh. Well, I didn't delete it. I'm not okay. deleting my account. Um, and as I check the headlines of the day on bonginoreport.com, okay. which um, not that Dan Bongino is the second coming of our Lord, uh, nor does he necessarily not have a vested interest <laughs> in making a whole lot of money um, as a former Secret Service agent who has gone Kind of red pillish, though. Definitely um, uh, mega red pill, um, if you can look at it that way. And as a man who professes Christianity, um, I check his headlines because what they do at that site is they catalog headlines from other places. So they don't they aren't doing news. They're grabbing news that seems relevant to a certain mindset, which I would probably fit into that FBI targeted mindset. <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh, well, so one of the things that you can see fun. this week that Senator Ted Cruz uh, pointed out was that uh, he had received a, um, uh, a a memo from the FBI, a copy of a memo that was circulated around the FBI uh, with uh, images that are uh, associated with domestic terrorism, such as the Bessie Ross flag, um, such as the don't tread on me symbol. So things that are images of American patriotism, the FBI is treating as images of domestic terrorism. And uh, uh, there was another flag, a third flag that he mentioned. I don't even know what it's called. It's uh, it's kind of like a come and get them flag, though. It's it's, it's about gun rights, yeah, gun rights and, and freedom. And he, he literally says, and every day as a senator, he takes off his boot, taking off his shoes. He puts it on the table. He says, I wear this because it's on the back of his boot. Am I a domestic terrorist? And the guy's like, I don't even know where that memo came from. So like the <laughs> FBI, deflect, 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 because they are they are the deep state. Anyway, I still believe there's a deep state. I think that we should be aware of that as Christians so that we do not have our churches shut down by lies. Um, that's my primary fundamental position. Um, and so what I am still doing is uh, retweeting with comment um, some of the more important things that I find in the headlines. So... 
I forget, I, three or four that I that were there this week um, dealing with uh, marriage about among other. Oh yeah, when the pope when the pope welcomes um, uh, transgender uh, emissaries to to visit with him and, and treats it all like it's great. Like maybe maybe you should realize that the Antichrist is still the Antichrist. It's never really changed. I know you Roman Catholics, you love your mass and your priests, but like Papa ain't a good guy. Papa ain't a good guy. Um, wow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, when he communes Nancy Pelosi after a Archbishop, you know, excommunicates her, like that that ain't that ain't cool. Papa. Yeah. So uh but I I what I'm not doing is uh flicking and it still hasn't helped. I'm I'm wanting but but this is like it's brought this back to mind all the more. I am so absolutely sick and tired of somebody else running my head. Yeah. I am just fed up with it. And, and when we had these conversations about movies uh, and watching movies with, uh, with the guys a little bit, you know, and I'm really trying to say, look, like it's, it's not sin. It's just stupid. Right. Yeah. Like I'm going to let somebody else control my soul for two hours. And this someone else is not a Christian and will only focus me on worldly things. And then I think about how much of my life was absorbed by that. And that makes me angry. Like I, like it is the matrix. It is. I was asleep in a bubble. I woke up and now I can't seem to shake the bubble though. Like it's, I, I, I want my mind to be run by my mind and the word of God. Um, not by memories of movies. I don't want to quote movies. I don't want to reference movies. Uh, I want to quote and reference scripture um, and I'm not even talking about to people. I'm talking about from my own thinking, right? When I'm just living today. Um, I, and so getting off of Twitter is sort of one more step in the direction of being uh, a liberated thinker from, from where I'm at, um, where I'm just not going to let someone else tell me what I should think about today. Even looking at the headlines is still participating in that, but it's significantly less addictive oh but i have found like there are these times like throughout the day where i just want to pick up my ipad isn't that funny i will have times throughout my month or year where i'm like oh i just really want to watch this movie right now and live vicariously through these people i don't even want to do something on the ipad i have no just pick obviously up your iPad. Just twitter hold it. twitter was the thing i did yeah so i want to i want to pick it up because from that is a dopamine fix that I was getting that I've just stopped getting. Okay. And so I'm being driven okay. yeah. to get a dopamine fix. Interesting. So just pick it up. Well, I mean, I, I want to pick it up and open it and do something. And actually one time I did and I looked at it and I was like, I'm not going to Twitter. <laughs> I've already checked the other thing. There's nothing to do here. Yeah. But I could feel, well, but if you opened Twitter, if you opened Discord, then there'd be something. And and it was like, I see you. I see wow. you. I see what you're doing. Uh-huh. Devil. Yeah. Shut that thing down. And yeah. and that's where again, like, you know, you can accuse me of being legalistic if you want about this. Um, but it, to me this isn't this isn't about uh, my my righteousness before Jesus or or whether or not God loves me or anything like that. This is about just self control in my own mind and yeah. not letting some liar take take me for a ride whenever he feels like it. And then seeing that they've done this with an addictive capacity, and like, I mean, I'm not going to say it on on live TV, but like like there's there's words in our culture for for how I feel about that guy now, and and I'll be. Um, I'll be blanked if, if I'm going to let them do that to me anymore. Yeah. I, they've had enough. They've had enough. And so that's, that's been this week is just, just really drawing that line hard. Um, I think it's important for the sake of the church to know. Um, and for the sake of my family, I think it's important to know that the IRS is doubling in size. It's going to be larger than the Pentagon. Not to, not to audit people who are poor, even though already 40 plus percent of all audits go to people who make under $75,000 a year. So, but they swear, they swear, trust us. I mean, you got all sorts of Democrats, trust us. Um, why would I, why would I trust you? So, um, you know, they're, they're, the IRS is, is doubling in size and um, uh, hoarding ammo, um, hiring, uh, hiring agents who will carry guns, right? 
Um, why? Yeah. Uh, but you know, it, what can I do about it? Nothing. Pray, pray against them. You know. Um, so I, I think it's valuable for a Christian to know that Caesar is doing this. You know, before he persecutes you in Rome, you could leave Rome. Right. That's okay. It's not wrong. Um, it isn't to be persecuted for being a Christian. That's to, to live under a tyrant. You don't have to live under a tyrant. Like there's no law, like stay under the tyrant. Yeah. Right? Oh, you're a slave. You can get your freedom. Don't. It doesn't say that. It says the opposite of that. Right. So, um, and then as a, as a overseer of a parish, you know, I, I want to know what, what is really happening out there as best I can, but you know, 10 minutes looking through the headlines, maybe clicking on one or two and glancing at the first three paragraphs of that thing and retweeting it is way better than I was probably given an hour a day to Twitter before. You know, I think, I think that the overall feeling of the country is starting to reflect what you've been talking about, um, that, that you felt that, that feeling of just overwhelm Mm -hmm. and, and, almost like a depression, a melancholy that then we're trying to suppress and And continue. Yes. And the other day, um, it, I mean, it was after my experience at Walmart, but I just, I had this now it's the full moon yesterday yesterday or the day before. And, um, uh, day before. So the th- on Thursday, it was full moon. And I know that that does physically impact. I mean, you're supposed to go fishing when it's full moon. Interior, so if yeah. it doesn't impact us, then why does it impact the fish? No, it impacts <laughs> us. There's no question. Um, but I Just I don't worship it. Right. I generally have gone out and about since 2020 and been interacting with people um, in stores and so forth in in the society and come away feeling like you know what everybody is still generally doing the same thing they're they're friendly if mm-hmm. you're friendly they're looking out for each other for the most part you know with themselves obviously placed a little bit in front but i never felt it super hostile the other day i was kind of starting to feel a little bit more like there was this hostility pull like everybody was getting just a bit more intense and a little bit more crazy and um i can only imagine that if we're all plugging into the twitter feed it's impacting or some everybody some version of way. it i mean uh, twi- one of the things about elon or musk instagram not, not, or yeah, facebook right, right. or some you know whatever it. the scrolling Con- consumption of media is but elon musk what was or he? just that he he's kind of pulled back from the deal to buy twitter and then they sued him to make him buy it yeah and he kind of countersued to make them show their actual records that kind of what's come out of that is twitter is not as used as twitter says it is and that a oh. large number of people on twitter are not just people on twitter they're people paid to be on twitter yeah. as agents of some buddy somewhere um and so uh twitter is not having as much of an impact as you might think however it does impact a certain elite class um and then the non-elites are being impacted by instagram um by uh tiktok by all these other other ones so it's all the same devil's playground in one way or the other it's just what 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 poison are you taking with as your drug of choice right is sort of the thing so uh, where just, are you getting your dopamine fix? There was just this more th- this undertone of like me first that I haven't experienced out here on the edge of the city. Mm-hmm. I kind of think it it would have been more um, noticeable to me earlier in this experience of uh, one year to slow the spread, but or two years or three, whatever we're at. But um, rest of your life to slow the spread. <laughs> But out here, it was kind of like the good old boys still. And even even though we had a lot of the um, city people, it just, we were stopping at red lights. We were letting pedestrians have the right of way. Mm. And it it seems like there's a little more rage. There's just a little more. I think it might um, just be your awareness. Um, we live in a third world country. Yeah. Not a third world state, a third world country. 
And the sooner that you can be honest about that, um, the more you're going to see this, uh, the more you can be wise and discerning about how best to be a Christian in such a time. Um, but yeah, it's there is no rule of law anymore. There isn't. They can they can raid a former president's house without reason while ignoring the current president's son's crack smoking whoremongering with American dollars. Um, so like, like that's, that's where we are and, yeah. um, we should not ignore that. Like you don't have to like, you can't do anything about it, but ignoring it is to maintain a story about the planet you live on that will not help your faith. Right. And I just, I think it's causing an unrest. I think it's, it's the water starting to boil. So one could make the case that the elites are intentionally causing unrest. Yes. Because they want, um, they want violence. Um, they want, they want less people. And the way to have less people, one way, is to convince them all to take each other out. And uh, I'm talking about global elitism, not like Hollywood at this point, Hollywood isn't global elite. They're the useful idiot. Okay. They're, they're Lenin or, or Stalin's useful idiot. Um, uh, they, they are and Justin Bieber, you know, they, they are just as much getting a piece of this as everybody else. Um, but they, they believe they're elite enough that it won't matter or, or think of, you know, so the, uh, New York and the DC mayors are really upset because governor Greg Abbott of Texas has been sending busloads of illegal immigrants out of Texas and, and, and to the, yeah, he continues to send them. And, uh, they requested, I think, it, I forget if it was New York or DC. I think it was DC requested, uh, from the Pentagon that they activate the national guard as a police force in DC to help yeah. deal with it. And the Pentagon yeah. said no. And so uh. they're really upset about this and how it's impacting life. Right. Um, so, okay, well, see, you're not elite enough then, are you? Uh, you thought you were elite, but you're not. But the ultimate top of this thing is, um, it doesn't matter what happens over there. It won't impact me. And what happens over there probably needs to be them having less so I can have more, which is, I mean, duh, that's how thieves work, right? Um, they don't, they don't believe in blowback. Uh, so the unrest that's here, um, one could make the case that that is, that is somewhat intentionally being driven and you don't even need a human agent in this. I mean, what do you think the devil wants? Do you think he wants peace? No, no. No. And if these if these tools that are brainwashing tools are really being ultimately funneled by him, yeah. what's he gonna funnel us toward? He's gonna funnel us toward war. That's what he's gonna funnel right. us toward. Whether it's whether it's actual civil war or whether it is simply um, just hating each other in the checking aisle because, you know, I need that last whatever, like baby formula. You know. Um, cause yeah. my baby, uh, and all this. And so the the need for survival is heightened. And as the need for survival is heightened, you will see more people as enemies. And as you see more people as enemies, the risk of treating them as an enemy increases. And um, all it will take is for the food to truly be in a shortage and you will have people violently acting. Um, ignoring this doesn't help you. Um, at the very least, it should inspire you to prayer, right? It's, it's not a cause to run around and scream about the sky falling. It's, it's not a reason to necessarily stockpile food, even although in any situation, you probably should have some rice and beans in the cupboard, just, a, you know, a month's worth or so. I mean, that's a good idea uh, in general as a human, since you can. Um, but uh, uh, the, the real thing here as the Christian is that you would just um, know how to pray, you know, and, and also not be deceived you're breathing heavy in the mic. Not be. Oh, I'm so sorry. Not be deceived by um, by the story, because when the story convinces you to believe it rather than the truth, it weakens your discernment powers. Period. You're more likely to be deceived after that. You know, if you're going to believe a lie, you're more likely to believe more lies than if you will believe the truth. You'll be able to discern in real time. Right. That's what wisdom is ultimately. So this is where again, you know, and Dr. Kuhn's brief history of power, kind of our whole agenda here a little bit is. Like, like, we don't have to fix any of this, but we need to not lie about it to each other anymore. Tell each other, well, Romans 13, love each other. I mean, no, 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 like, stop that. Stop it. Right. This isn't love. There's nothing loving about uh, 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 recognizing personal pronouns. Like, there's nothing loving, uh, preferred personal pronouns. There's nothing loving about that. You're actually harming the person. So, you now stop this nonsense, you know, um, at least acknowledge that it's nonsense, right? Um, there's a... 
So before I got off Twitter, there was a uh, a TikTok video that was reposted on Twitter. I saw of a, I don't know if she was grade school or high school teacher. And she was very distraught because she had spent the day um, talking with her class about how she wanted to know their preferred pronouns so that she could she could use them because it was important. And, and so she ran around and asked everybody and one of the kids, and I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was like, it was like banana and steampunk or something like that. And she got, she said, um, you know, and I, I told him, you know, this isn't funny. You, you shouldn't joke about this. And he said, I'm not. I'm not. And he held deadpan. So she comes home and is like crying on TikTok about how she feels that maybe he's taking advantage of her, but she also knows he was serious. And so she doesn't know what to do. Yeah. Because she, you know, this is the religion at work, right? Like, are you going to break your religion? I mean, he, he held you to it. He said he called the bluff. He called the bluff. You know, kids, try this at home. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, so anyway, yeah, Twitter, less Twitter. Um, How's this? So I'm reading a, uh, a book. <laughs> Duh. Um, I'm reading uh, a book that I, I, we recommended it last week, sort of without really recommending it. And, and so here it is again, um, Awaken the Giant Within by, by Tony Robbins. Tony Robbins is a fascinating human being. How did he get his powers? That's what I want to know. He knows, he sees humans with such clarity. He gets our psyche. Um, he's read a lot. I know that. He's also traveled to India and visited faith healers in demonic darkness. So I, I don't know where, where Tony Robbins gets his powers, nor do I ha, nor do I recommend everything he ever said. Um, Awaken the Giant Within is filled with tremendous insights into ways to mess with, improve, fix your head. And I'll, I'll give you two of them here. You heard me say one the other day. So he's got this, this concept called scrambling. So you have a, a feeling that you often have. You have a pattern or a habit that you often do and you don't like it mm -hmm. and you want to change it, but you don't know how. So the, the short end was um, sit when you, when you catch yourself in it, sit there for a second, imagine it, the event as a movie. Imagine, and I'll do this for a second. I'll explain this like by showing you mine in a moment. Imagine the event as a movie, turn it into a cartoon, make it ridiculous, repeat. And the theory here is that, so you have this emotional channel your brain is in, like all your thoughts are running through this electrical channel in your head, right? I'm depressed, I'm depressed, I'm depressed, I'm depressed. And you're basically taking a big purple crayon and scribbling on it, right? Um, so for me, this turned into like, uh, whenever I'm catching myself in a certain mood and it's been good, it's just like, it's turned into a channel that, that pops up when I face certain emotions, like it actually repeats itself, right? Which is the idea. And so it, it you're like diverting off of the channel. Um, and, uh, uh, the way it is, is that I just see myself as a stick figure cartoon. And then I always have like a little cloud bubble above my head with like black scribbles and like angry exclamation points and like, and then it's raining, like right on me, like there's a cloud just raining on me. But then everything around me is like rainbow bright explosions of light and just everything's good and people are smiling and the, the birds are singing and but I'm walking around with this really dark thing. Um, and then it's starting to become like a purple crayon over the entire thing, right? Um, I found that as a mental exercise to be fascinatingly effective. Um, does it mean I have no depression? No, no, it does, doesn't necessarily mean that. Um, but it means that I don't just have to sit there and wallow in it, right? Um, I'm going to try to think what the other one he did. Uh, oh, what is it? I'm, gonna, I'm not going to get it now that I just told that one. There's another tact like that um, that I picked up this week that I found uh, really, really useful. I'm not going to be able to find it, though, quickly enough. But um, if, I, if I think of it, I'll share it. Uh, the... I have a quote, though, from the book that is in a different direction. And th this quote is, uh, your brain can't tell the difference between something you vividly imagine and something you actually experience. Wow. Now, maybe he's wrong. Maybe he's wrong. He, he just said that. There wasn't a footnote, right? Um, 
his point in this is that in the in the section is he's talking about how you know, <coughs> the stories you're telling yourself about your life impact your emotions. How you feel is a result of what you're thinking, the story you're saying. And the more you say a certain story, the more you're going to feel it. And so if you're imagining certain things about your future, you're going to feel what would happen if those things happened, even if they never happen. And so he's saying, you know, you don't have to continue imagining these things. You can actually take control and create imagination of other things and that that will over time change the way you feel. And um, I really can't disagree with that, honestly. I mean, it's not a biblical thought. Um, it's It totally makes sense though. Um, but then where this is interesting to me now, the reason I wrote it down wasn't because of uh, psycho-emotional personal like uh, growth, your brain can't tell the difference between something you vividly imagine and something you actually experience. Movies, TV, video games. So much of my anxiety is a result of stories I lived that weren't my life. And I still carry the scars from. Right. You don't have to agree with me. That's from me. And that's where I'm like, I'm done letting them scar me. Yeah. No more. Well, uh, Chloe was mentioning the re bit of research that she had been exposed to about um, how trauma is a result of being exposed to um a one-time event or repeated events or, you know, there are different different things in our experiences that that will actually have long-term tra traumatic effects on us. And uh, movies or videos, uh, video games actually fit those criteria mm -hmm. of repeated traumatic right. experiences. Right. Right. that you witness it right. doesn't have to actually physically touch you but it's just something you witness and it impacts our psyche to a level that we and our children's psyches to a level that we just are not even aware oh, we've, we've subverted it to a point where you can actually have cptsd not from your parents but from your movie watching habits as a child you think so the what she described yeah was exactly what is described as CPTSD. Wow. And so if you put those two things together, if you were raised in a, a, a family that's going to cause have you be the scapegoat and then you were ignored or um, wa right. uh, set in front of a television as your babysitter, like... To pummel yourself Christ with, have mercy. with stories of... Christ men. have mercy. Yeah. These poor, poor children and and adults now, because <laughs> our parents did not have television forming them the way that we did. Yeah, Sesame Street, that little can of tuna, like the fact that I can totally remember exactly how they drew the the cat's head flattening on the can of tuna. Yeah. I didn't watch that with you. Right. I watched it five years later. Right. Than you, but I know the one you're talking about, and I experienced right. the emotion of it's it. It's as real to you as if it actually happened, yes. and that's again. So, so Christians, huh? Don't you want to live in real land? Yeah, I, I do. Again, again, you can take your gambit with this, play your game, disagree with me. That's fine. Um, I want to live in real land. Right. I want to know what it's like to have a brain that operates. I'm never going to get 100%, but I want to get to like 95% real. And it's so a part of our culture that to say give up movies, give up it's theater like yeah. is so offensive. But that also exposes the idolatry of it. To speak of an actor or an actress as a hypocrite. Like what Pretender. did you just say? Pretender. Pretender. That person um, is my hero. That person poser, is my father. Poser. Yeah, right. Essentially, like right. my father figure, my mother figure. I don't have one that I can look to in this life. And so that person that you've just slandered with that awful word is my my family. 
It's yeah. sad. It's so sad. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Well, and I slipped into this. I followed um, the Gaines family for a hot five minutes. And then, you know, started joking about, oh, I've got to go to Target and see my besties mm -hmm. and, you know, look at them in their little picture. Platonic that's friends. There. I'm going to buy their stuff and like think about Joanna designing it. Like, really? No, she did not design her stuff. <laughs> uh, so anyway, like I'm not, it's not that I'm above it. I've, I've done it. I've been there. Um, but to say, you know what? But I have she, a goal in life to just stop doing this yeah. ridiculous pretending. Well, and to, right, let's put her in her in her place in my life. Like, she is not my bestie. She cares nothing for me. She did not specifically design the soap holder to go in my bathroom, okay? It's just something she did or had somebody else do for her in her busy work week. Yeah. And yeah. if I were to contact her and be like, my husband and I have a YouTube show and and I have I've thought of you often and I think of how do you handle your stress and your family life with your fame you know how do you juggle it juggle it she wouldn't respond to me probably not i don't know no probably not i mean i could i could reach out and be like hey just just so you know i think about you and i'm thankful for you yeah. that i'm I sure could they do, get a lot of that but kind i'm of not mail. right but like to then think that she's going to be my friend. Right. <laughs> like, well, she can't be. Humanly humanly speaking, no. she can't be. It's impossible. It's even super hard to just be friends with the people in my own community. Yeah, like right. to actually invest the time that I want to, to reach out on birthdays or to reach out on special occasions in the, in the year and be like, hey, friend. You mean something to me. That's hard enough as it is in just this tiny little Rockford square of the world. And it's harder like, when you're busy being besties with someone who doesn't exist. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. So absolutely. Just being real is so, it's like crazy talk. It's like talking about being carnivore almost, you know? <laughs> yeah. That's, that's his own like like weird dynamic because it's it I is about me it is about being real <laughs> i guess too but like this is that seems more radical in like a um like you're gonna die kind of way yeah. and this is like why do you care yeah you know because <laughs> well, i don't want you to die <laughs> what? i don't want you to die um but th but yeah. this one though isn't really got that sort of moral imperative to be healthy with it this is just sort of like how dare you say that what i'm doing is wrong but isn't it interesting that we then say that physical health is something that we can talk about but mental health like that's your that's your deal fentanyl take right. it whatever right physical health is also less and less something you can talk about fat shaming is continuing to to be a concern, oh yeah i'm right? sorry target but that was disturbing well I don't know if I want to go there at all. Right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Target. Why are you going to Target? That's what I want to know. I need to stop. It's just on the way. You know, it's yeah. like, oh, we're here. Okay. I know they'll carry this thing. this thing. Yeah. I don't go and see my besties anymore because I don't have besties in Texas. Oh, actually. Well, we have friends in Texas. We do have <laughs> low places, as it were. Hello, if you're watching. Um, But... I don't call them my besties anymore. And I'm kind of frustrated that they chose Target. Like that made me go, maybe even though they talk about Jesus as being a part of their life in their Baptist way, maybe we don't actually see eye to eye on a lot of things because they chose Target. Target was willing to pay. Money talks, money talks, money talks. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's cynical, I suppose. But as a Christian, really, you want to link arms with that? That disturbed me. So, yeah. So what? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm the getting thing nervous. Is they, once, I'm they, stick once, they own you, once they own you, they own you. They may have signed some deals before uh, 2008. I don't know. I don't know that they were being, they were picked up by them until by after that. that. Yeah. 
Um, but so. I just, I stopped reading the magazine because I was like, uh, I just don't, there's this, I can smell, I can smell a whiff of worldview that I'm like, mm, I don't, I don't really love this. Yeah, it's just more Instagram anyway. It's, it's, no, it's more, uh, it's more Pinterest. It's Pinterest, but then there's this focus on people that they have where it's like, look at this amazing person and how they overcame the trials of life and did this amazing thing. And I just, I'm, I'm starting to smell whiffs of like, oh, I, yeah. I feel like at one point or another, I'm going to open it and then there's going to be something about the yeah. transgender agenda. And, and it will be like the path will have been paved already. already and I right. don't know. And ladies out there who like Magnolia Journal, like it's a beautiful magazine. And Bella Grace, beautiful magazine, not beautiful content, like super worldly content. Yeah, worldly. <laughs> worldly is a word that we got to learn to deal with again. Um, I remembered my, only, uh, my other mind hack from, uh, from, oh, good. from Tony Robbins. Mm -hmm. And speaking of people who will talk about other people as examples that are just too much for you to possibly do, that there's a lot of that in the book, actually. But this idea I found valuable, and it is um because one of his one of his propositions that i'm still skeptical of but I, <laughs> seems to be true um is that uh you can change the way you feel right now like feelings are things you choose now, and as a lifelong anxious depressed person mul uh, multiple times uh medicated for this as someone who definitely drank for a while to kind of hide this um uh like this is like too good to be true. Okay, so are we gonna try it? Because like I have yes. kind of a side headache. <laughs> okay, well this is, is not it emotional. Look, if, is if, it you, if you if you if you broke your knee, the pain in your knee is still gonna be there. Okay. Okay. So so this this is about your emotional fragile. Let's see how position. do I feel. Hmm. Okay. Now this isn't. I'm not gonna make the claim that this is like going to permanently resolve all of your problems. Okay. This is just what he did to show you. You can change how you feel right now. Okay. So you're okay. going to walk me through it. Yes. Okay. It's pretty Let's straightforward. Um, I, it may help to close your eyes. Okay. Okay. Remember a time you felt really good. Think about that feeling. Notice how you feel it. Look at that. You control how you feel. It's pretty straightforward. Okay. So can I go like really crazy? Okay. I don't know if I want to go really crazy. <laughs> I don't know. I remember a time. Let's let's call it long ago. Long ago, because it, it certainly was something that occurred um, in my my early twenties, where um, I would take a a then illegal substance and I would smoke it, and it would feel good. Okay. And part of uh, my favorite way to do that um, involved a, a glassware with water in it. And so you would sit there and it would bubble. Okay. And you'd take this really long breath. Right. And then you would like do this little thing and like. Yeah. And you would hold your breath and you would let it out and it would feel good. If I take a really long breath, imagining that, I feel great. Really? It's really weird. Wow. Okay. Just, just breathing. And, and the, the oxygen part is like there anyway. There's all sorts of science. Like take a deep breath. It's going to feel better, right? Okay. But yeah. I just add that imaginary moment of remembering yeah. why I, like I was doing it for, let's not that call them good feeling. reasons, but I was, I was chasing a feeling. Yeah. And I can remember the feeling and it is a version of the feeling. Wow. Okay. Yeah, huh? Well, I, so mine was waking myself up um, because I was laughing in my dreams. I love that. You laughed like right I away. It was that. funny. I'm like, oh, I got her. Look at that. She laughed. <laughs> and it, I had that sensation of butterflies in my stomach that I get when I, when that happens to me. So that's interesting then. I mean, it makes sense that yours would be something that you. Um, well, cause I was, I'm still, you know trying to get away from pain the reason i would want to change the way i feel is because generally my feeling is some form of, of traumatic and emotional and deep and abiding and everlasting existential pain <laughs> just, just pile that on um but so between the scrambling and and the 
what uh, the mimicking memory uh, process. Um, like I'm not, I'm not better. I'm not healed. I'm not fixed, but I've had definite moments of feeling different. Okay. So <laughs> as Christians, nice. like, do we have a lot of questions? Can we, we keep we, talking? Well, we can talk. We do. Okay. We have questions there. There. Yeah. We're fine. Um, as Christians, like there are so many of these. Oh, what, what's Matt that? Glover asked how he could do a wild turkey. Okay. No, no, no. Really, really. So wild, you, wild turkey wild turkey's a alcohol. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> like, really? I mean, I don't know. Look, they're weird look, beasts. <laughs> maybe this won't work for you. I'm not claiming that this, but, but. Oh, that feeling of it going warm down Well, your if you throat. want that, or like when I, what I liked about beer is that about two thirds through the first beer, I felt really good. Not as good as this other feeling that is in fact probably like. I don't know. I've never experienced anything like that. Um, so, but the, the feeling of that warm buzz, like, as I say that I can, I can remember it and it's a version of it. Right. And so the idea is like, instead of going to any wild Turkey or any other uh, alcohol, just remember the warm feeling you had in the room at that moment. And in fact, you produce it. And then again, if you're talking about brain being channels, right. Channels of thought, every time you do that, you're creating a channel of that emotion. And by doing that over time, you're going to make that a more normal part of your experience to the level where you might use that channel without having to have the thought to create it. And oh, that's Tony's yeah. that's Tony's proposition is that over time you can produce a new way of feeling by practicing it. I I, I don't you know nobody take quit their meds immediately, although look up how the antidepressants don't help you. That that just came out 2 weeks ago. I mean it's really important. It's they lied oh. for years and years and years. Yeah. But, I a, a couple who had a COVID wedding and I got to stand up as the maid of honor because they, you know, you could only have like 10 people in the sanctuary or whatever. <laughs> Ridiculous. Anyway, um, the best man went by fentanyl. Oh. It's gone. Yeah. Like, I, I had supper with that guy. Oh, I remember now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like we had a reception, a little reception so at their house. And it was so just sad. like, because you had mentioned fentanyl being an issue across the nation. Mm -hmm. And it was like, okay, but it, I knew this person. I mean, not knew. Oops. I supped with him. Supped. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sup. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Ate <laughs> <laughs> yeah. meal. I ate meal with him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and done gone and it was just he was just trying to i don't know i don't know escape how fentanyl works he was trying i don't to escape know if his you self-regulate like it, if you just take more because you, the doctor says okay just take more if you don't feel well, it's good not, it's not a doctor it's not a doctor and it was probably something that was cut with it and and so he took a drug that should in this dosage do something but because it was fentanyl instead it was too much so right. it's not like a pill bottle that you just take a I little honestly pill. don't know with I have this no, one I'm so but in the dark what i know what is that is. um that your uh dosaging is the problem right so a little yeah. fentanyl won't kill you the problem is you'll use it again and again and again and then you'll do it's like heroin you'll, okay. you'll use so too much you're at trying once. to seek that initial feeling yes and you just keep going yes. okay okay yes. oh that's yes. so yeah so, but, but uh, back to, back to Matt Glover and wild, that's, that's wild your name, turkey. wild turkey. Like <laughs> the point is like, fi find a memory you really want to remember, find a feeling you really, I, I would not, I don't want to feel, um, uh, buzzed all the time. Honestly, I, I don't, um, I don't mind if I had a beer, it's all right. I don't do it very often anymore. Um, but, um, to feel uplifted, um, without any of the side effects of, of being uplifted, none of, none of the rest of that, right? Just to, to remember feeling sunshine on my face. Um, that's a good one there, actually. Um, oh, yeah. So uh, it's Oh, it's, can it's everybody just rejoice with tool. me right now? I can breathe out of both nostrils. Like, oh, good. <laughs> just for five seconds. Yeah, it was all well. Don't worry. <laughs> oh, man. Afrin. Afrin. Um, I don't know. So we're going to get to our, well, when you need to sleep. Yeah. And That's only for three days, no more. <laughs> uh, getting to questions here uh, from you, Bible Answers, uh, Stop the White Noise is again brought to you by the Hebrew Collegium and Mad Christianity. And is there anything else I need to promote before we go on? You can find everything else that we do 
at revfist.com. And if you have questions like the one that we're about to ask and you would like that to be asked on the show, send that to the contact page through the contact page at revfisk.com, R-E-V-F-I-S-K.com slash contact. All right, so here we go. Uh, Bert says, I'm a lifelong LCMS member and I am dealing with a person who is socially challenged and is not able to attend church at this time, even though he has faith and is Lutheran. He has difficulty with crowds. Uh, I think the technical term for that is agoraphobia, um, Mm. fear of places, fear of crowded places. Um, The agora was the shopping market in the ancient world. Oh, interesting. Okay. Agoreth the Thagartemes. You were bought with a price. Um, You were bought at market. Agoreth. Agoreth the Ta. The ending is the you were. Right. And then Agora, you were marketed, you were marketed Mm -hmm. for a price, um, Timais, honor. Um, So uh, in order for him to receive communion, do the elements need to be consecrated by an ordained pastor? Or can I bless the bread and wine and give them to him using the words of institution in the hymnal? Unless you ask, why wouldn't the pastor come and do this for you? He says, the person does not want me to go to the pastor for help. So it's that last bit that tells me, don't do it for sure. Don't do it. Um, the avoidance of the pastor, whatever reason, um, is not good. Is the pastor a really bad person? Oh. Well, then that needs to be dealt with as a congregation. Is he just hiding his shame? Probably. Um, so the reason that you have a pastor is to confront that directly. That's his job. And so end around him and basically you will you will co-enable his his shame. Um, that's to say nothing of the theology behind the office of the ministry, the stewardship of the gifts, uh, the life of the church, who, who rightly consecrates, who rightly does not consecrate. Um, you would be us- usurping authority for yourself. You'd be running without being sent. You'd be a, a dreamer prophesying dreams. Uh, it doesn't mean that it wouldn't actually work. I have no idea, but um, this is not a good plan. This is not a good plan. Um, uh the power of the office of the ministry to consecrate the sacrament belongs to the church. That doesn't mean you and me. That means the entire Christian church on earth, which we only experience as congregations, which means it belongs to the congregation, not in the voters assembly, um, not by some like weird, you know, philosophical, the, the, the congregation is where the Lord's supper is supposed to happen for the sake of, of congregating. You congregate around the Lord's Supper. It belongs to you all together. Hence, nobody should have the liberty to just grab it and run and do what they feel like with it. And really, the only one who should handle it is the one man that they appoint as an overseer among them to oversee the reception of the Lord's Supper. Like, that's his job. (laughs) That's what he does. It's therefore his stewardship Uh, It's not his authority. It's the church's authority that he stewards. He holds the office. An office is a position of authority um, in order to steward the supper for the sake of the faith of the flock. And if this individual is part of the flock, then it is um, beholden upon him to, uh, we'll get to this a little, you know, respect his overseer. Um, See the overseer as the one to whom Jesus, or the one whom Jesus has sent for him to receive the Lord's Supper. Why would he go around that? can't be a healthy reason. There's no such thing as a healthy reason. I mean, even if the reasons, well, the guy raped me. Okay. Then he needs to not be pastor anymore. Right? Like you, he doesn't, you don't fix the problem by like, like end around in here. Right? So no matter what the issue is, um, I don't like the pastor. He's personally weird. So what? Right now, again, you have this person who is, um, they're struggling. You see their need, you're having mercy and pity on them. But what you sound like you're doing is you're about, you're in a, a, an enabling, a co-enabling relationship with this person. Right. And you're going to enable their sickness and you're going to be p- become part of how they keep their sickness and don't heal. And so you will be required more and more in their life so that they can not heal and avoid their issues with you being the temporary fix. In fact, an idol of sorts. So um, uh, boundaries. Yeah. We recommend the book every week. It's going to come up again later today. But boundaries, um, th- this is not good boundaries. And that's to say nothing of the theology of the matter, which is that the the pastoral office is given for this very purpose. Um, Baptism would be something that in an emergency a Christian might truly do. Uh, You see that the person wants to be baptized. Um, You see that for the sake of their conscience, it needs to be now. Um, Perhaps they're about to die. Um, You go right on ahead and and exercise um, 
that sending of the church to baptize and teach, um, that would be a emergency situation, I believe is the way the, the dogmatics, Lutheran dogmatics talk about it. So in an emergency situation, you may certainly baptize, but normally you would encourage them to come to church and get baptized because baptism is entry into the church. It's not baptize and leave them alone on an island. It's baptize and come to church now. Um, and so, uh, you know, if they're going to die again, okay, emergency, there is no emergency Lord's Supper. Like you believe in Jesus, you can die. It's okay. You don't, it's great to have the Lord's Supper before you die, but like, no, no, you're okay. You're okay. Can you get to church? Come to church. Does the pastor come visit you? He'll come visit you. But to like break the order for the sake of we feel like it. Bad trajectory. So Bad like trajectory. the Lord's Supper isn't necessary, necessarily salvific. You aren't saved through the Lord's Supper. Well, you're, you're already saved. Sustained it, it through the Lord's Supper. It feeds your salvation. So I wouldn't right. want to say you're not saved by the Lord's Supper, but you're taking the Lord's Supper because you're saved. Okay. We don't, we don't let someone up who isn't saved. Right. Right. They already believe in, you're, you believe in Jesus, you're saved. Right. But, I mean, you know, does it impart the righteousness of Christ by which you are saved? Yes. Yeah. You know, stop, stop getting so German about it. So there was an, a conversation over uh, at the Collegium recently about like just the fact that, um, so one thing that we do is I've been going over every day and helping cook breakfast and clean up just so that they can see the routine. And and then um, on the schedule, we have Lord's Supper fast for um, Sunday morning. So like there's no breakfast prepared. That doesn't mean that they don't, they can't eat something that's in the fridge or they can't make themselves something if they need it, but it's not going to be prepared and there's nobody designated to do it. So that to encourage, you know, you can fast until you take the Lord's Supper and then have a big, we'll have steaks when they come home for lunch instead of sardines. Um, Yeah. So anyway, uh, the comments were like, I feel a little funny taking the Lord's Supper at 8 a.m. and then coming back and taking the Lord's Supper at 10 a.m. because I just had it. Like how, how do you respond to that? Because to me, it's kind of like, well, the, it's the highlight of the service and it's being offered and it's for the, the sustenance of my faith. So why wouldn't I? Um, and so, yeah, can you, can you take, talk I mean, to you, that? You just kind of said it like, well, why not? I mean, if you don't want to, don't take it. Um, it's not something that they should feel obligated to do if they, like you're not a bad Christian. If you then sit out at 10 AM. It's a moment where you get to exercise your faith by believing what Jesus said. There's not really a reason not to do that more than once a day. Mm -hmm. The reason why we don't do it more than once a day is it's kind of hard to get the whole congregation together multiple times a day Mm -hmm. to do that. But if you attend multiple services on a Sunday, you're free. There's a point at which like, like, Offering it twice on Sunday itself is sort of weird. Okay. What it means is that we won't build a building big enough for all of us. <laughs> or settle on a time to come. <laughs> or settle on a time for all of us to be here. Yeah. Um, but anybody who is here for both, and by the way, this is a thing at St. Paul's. Some people go to both services because it's... Um, well, there are two very different congregations. Essentially, I mean, yeah, you don't, true. you do have a little bit of overlap where some people will waffle back and forth. But like, if you want to see everybody, yeah. and we are kind of that country church, so you do. You, it's your community, and so you want to see at least those of us who um, have really de- like jumped in to try to be a part of a community. We see it as like our friends, our family, and so like. If you, want, if you out. want the full Bible study, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, all hour and 15 minutes of it, you need both. You need right. both sermons. And um, so, uh, but so like you're having the Lord's Supper at the start and at the end of Bible study kind of thing. Like, like I don't know. It it doesn't matter in such a way. Like, like if you're like, oh, I don't know if I want to go up. Well, then don't go up. But like, there's no reason not to. There's not like a reason not to. It like go up. You're here. The Lord's Supper is being offered. Like, it's kind of the idea of Thanksgiving dinner being served at two and then you serve it again at five. You know, it's kind of like, well, we're a, right. little, like, we're a little hungry. Or that's maybe a really good way to seven look at it. Like, like don't you eat more than once a day? 
So like, what's the problem? You're just eating the meal that Jesus gives. And as a meal, it is his promise to you. And so you're having the opportunity to exercise your faith in that meal more than once in the morning. So you're going to go up, you're going to reverence, you're going to look at the crucifix, you're going to say, amen, you're going to you know, have, uh, you know, the, the music kind of lifting up the experience. Like, like, I mean, are there, are, is there such a thing as too many flowers? Hmm. Right. Um, I guess if you think so, don't have so many flowers, you know, but it's just sort of a, it's, if you view the Lord's Supper as a work, then I can see where this would be kind of a, like, why am I doing this more than once? If you view the Lord's Supper as, as a magical event that kind of gives you what you need for the week or something, like, why would you need more? Um, you know? If you think that like having a bigger gulp or a smaller gulp is going to change the amount of Lord's Supper you get, all it is, is the binding of you to Christ in real time for your conscience sake. It can't happen too much if you believe it. Huh? Okay. Very good. All right. Let's move over here to uh, Luke's question. Uh, he says, uh, Rev. and Mrs. Fisk, recently I've been attending... Attempting to explain to my wife why Lutheran clergy do some of the things that they do. Since she comes from a non-denominational background, she is uncomfortable with certain aspects. Uh, specifically, I knew this, like when Kate was, uh, Frisbee was telling me this morning, like she's reading this and I've not seen this yet. And I'm like, I know exactly what she's going to be uncomfortable really? with. Oh, yeah. Um, always. Always. Oh, it's always the same it, from this group of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She is uncomfortable uh. with certain aspects, specifically the pastor saying, I forgive you your sins. Oh, interesting. That was something in my family. How can you forgive sins? Only God can forgive mm -hmm. sins. Her objection is this distinguishes the pastor as more esteemed than the laity, hmm. placing improper importance on the role of the pastor. I've referenced John 20. Um, you know, the, he who sin you forgive, they forgiven. He who you retain, they are retained. Uh, as the place in scripture where Christ commands his apostles to forgive sins. However, she does not recognize this as the true interpretation of the passage. She believes the aforementioned verses are Jesus' instructions to the apostles to teach the Christians to forgive without mention of the pastor having a special role. Her belief being that the pastor should say, Jesus forgives you of your sins. So when I say in the command and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you. Like it means Jesus forgives you. Like, it's just fancy Lutheran talk. <laughs> there, it means Jesus forgives you, but it means that Jesus forgives you by letting me forgive you. And so if I'm going to teach Christians to forgive each other so that you would forgive someone at home, and that is also Jesus forgiving, then why can't I do that to you as a group since I'm like your father in the faith? Like all I'm doing is exercising the power that we all have to forgive each other for you so you can believe it. So it's a strange thing to be like, I don't want forgiveness unless it comes from like my brother at home. Only then does it really count. Like, huh, weird. And I'm going to get to this idea about elevating the pastor because that's the weirdest argument here, uh, honestly, of all. Um, but I, I really want to emphasize that absolution as the pastor preaches it is basically just preaching. Like as the pastor does it is, is preaching. It's like if you imagine everything that I'm doing with the sermon Okay, I am I am in theory rightly distinguishing law and gospel in order to build your faith through the promises of Christ. So take that forty-five minute sermon and boil it down to one sentence. That's it. That's absolution. I boiled the gospel down to one sentence. I forgive you. Yeah, and it isn't just Jesus in the sky forgives you. Um, it's that He's given this power to the church. Now you can look up Matthew sixteen and Matthew eighteen. And see how this power is very much given to the church. And in fact, he calls it the keys of the kingdom. Okay. Um, this won't convince her either. Nothing will convince her because um, she has decided to believe that there is no power to forgive sins among men. So teaching Christians to forgive each other just in their personal forgiveness um, is not the same as being forgiven in the sight of God for her like psychological experience of this. Otherwise, why would you have a problem with someone doing for all of us what we do to each other all the time? Your argument is we're supposed to do this all the time. You're right. Why do you have a problem with one guy doing it for us as an example? Uh, why? It, oh, because it elevates the pastor. Okay, well, let's let's get to that. But um, before we get to that, uh, here's my, this is my favorite answer to this, okay? Because, you know, 
how can you forgive sins? Only God can forgive sins. You have to say Jesus forgives you. You can't say you forgive you. Do you know that's what they said to Jesus? Huh? That's what they said to Jesus. So when you're quoting the Pharisees. Oh, dear. <laughs> I think you should be careful about where you stand. Right? You know, Jesus saw their faith and said to the paralytic, this is uh, Mark chapter 2, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God? So Jesus, perceiving their spirit, said, why do you reason in your heart, which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or arise, take your bed and walk? Well, so you may know the Son of Man can forgive sins. Hey, rise, take your bed and walk. He rose, he took his bed and walked. They all glorified God. We never saw anything like this. Now, here's the thing I, I really think is important about this. I don't think Jesus saying, I forgive your sins to the man at that time was something other than what Hebrews believed to begin with. It's what the Old Testament teaches. That faith in God is the faith in the God who forgives sins. And when you come to that God, the priest should say to you, your sins are forgiven. In fact, this is the entire Levitical system is to do that. And they got to the point where they had rejected the forgiveness of sins because only God can do it. I mean, I was, I'm reading a book about the history of, of the first century and like they had rejected teaching the Old Testament at that time in the rabbinical schools because they were afraid they might teach it wrong. Hmm. And so they only taught the oral tradition, which was created to protect the Old Testament from, from being removed. And they would, they would only comment on that because since there, it's like you, got, you built the wall to protect it and you're just going to talk about the wall now. And what happened again is then God shows up and they're like, who are you? And they can't recognize him, right? Because they, they'd rejected his word. They'd, they'd invalidated the, the, the word of God for the traditions of men. So I, I think just, and this isn't going to convince your wife. Um, no, I think what you said about like in the set and by the command, I think that's pretty important like for her to just it's recognize, a non, it's a oh, that's him saying Jesus says. Yeah, Jesus okay. says, I forgive you. Like literally, Jesus says, I forgive you. Like, yeah. I'm just actually here saying it. And I do also. You know, not not by my own. Because that's what she's asking for. She's like, can't he just say Jesus said? But and he's like, yeah, when you, when he you, does. When you find yourself making an argument that is the argument oh, yeah. the Pharisees <laughs> made against Jesus, you should just take a step back. Yeah. That's that's point one. Um, point two, it, it wrongly elevates the pastor above the Christians. Okay. Now look, the pastor is not a better person than you. Although to be a pastor, he's supposed to be. Okay. But he isn't like on the last day going to be declared more forgiven than you or any such thing like that. But if you read the Bible and cannot see that the pastor is to be treated as different than the rest of the congregation, you don't know your Bible nearly so well as you think you do. So we'll just start with 1 Timothy 3, which is like the setup for there should be pastors. Hey, Timothy, you're a lefty there make some pastors. He says, this is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop an overseer, episcopate, pastor, shepherd, um, he desires a good work. So, so the position of the pastor is a particular good work. And then he gives all the lists of what is required. He's got to be blameless. So again, the pastor is not a better person than you, although he's supposed to be. Like his, it's his job actually to look like a Christian all the time. That, that, that's, that's the way he's supposed to be tested before he's a pastor. Okay. So it's kind of strange that you'd be, you'd be like all up on this. Well, the pastor's not better than me. Um, well, you're kind of right, like on judgment day and all, but like, why, why would you want your pastor to be a more sinful than you? That seems really weird, actually. Like, don't, don't you want your pastor to be like a good guy? Like, right. So it's just very American almost communist though, uh, arrogance here. So, okay. So now let's look at, um, this is Hebrews. Yeah. Hebrews 13, uh, verse seven. Remember those who rule over you. Is that talking about the government? No, this is not talking about the government. Uh, remember those who rule over you. So it sounds like they're over you. If nothing else, who have spoken the word of God to you. Okay. So those who are speaking the word of God to you, who rule are ruling over you by speaking. The word. It sounds like they're distinguished, right? I, what, what was the language of the of the question? Um, it's just really it kind of it kind of got under my craw, I guess, a little bit. Um, uh, what was it that uh, uh, in placing improper importance on the role of the pastor? 
Don't well, play. and it's also playing into your need as a man for respect. And so you're like, excuse me. Placing improper <laughs> importance on the role yeah. of the pastor. Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. And then verse 17, obey those who rule over you and be submissive for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief for that would be unprofitable to you. So I don't know where you're getting this idea that there shouldn't be any emphasis on the pastor as having a role, which is in fact to rule over you with the word of God for the sake of your soul, which to me, forgiving you seems like, like the most awesome thing that can be done, right? Like, I mean, I can tell you about how to distinguish knowledge and wisdom and discipline and apply it to engineering. I actually can. But that isn't quite the same thing as declaring to you that your debts have been nailed to the cross and the precious blood of Jesus. And as a result, I, in his name, forgive you. For goodness sakes, I pray the name of Jesus over you for money, but I can't do it for forgiveness. You see the, uh, the, the demon in the water. So it's all over the Bible. Uh, First, Kim, First Timothy five, all over the New Testament. Let the elders, verse seventeen. Let the elders who rule, there it is again. Sounds like they're in charge. Sounds like the pastor's in charge. But that's not fair. What if he's bad? Then you kick him out. But if he's not bad, let the elder who rules well. Now, let's go back. <laughs> I'm gonna go back to this language again, though, right? Um, improper importance. Let the pastor who rules well be counted worthy of double honor. Does that sound like importance? Honor? I know you're writing something down, but are you were you listening? Yes, it does. Yeah. 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 Honor. So yeah. Let the Definitely. let the elder who rules well be counted worthy of double honor. So like you that would mean he would like stand set apart from the so congregation. So he gets to sit at the head of the table. He would be he, he would be seen as in some way <laughs> distinct from everybody else because it's exactly. a double it's a double honor yeah okay well, so i don't know where you're getting this idea that we shouldn't give pastors double honor because it's it's right here in first Timothy five especially those who labor in word and doctrine for the scripture says you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain and labors with his wages which means you should pay your pastor too but like honestly the the the, the real honor is not the money um but the respecting of his his preaching since it's the word of god anyway right again if he's not preaching the word of god then he's not worthy of any honor it's not just like, hey, I'm a pastor, therefore honor me, right? It's uh, the one who proclaims the word of God is, is worthy of double honor. Don't improperly set him apart by having him proclaim the gospel. That would be weird. Um, okay, and the next question is going to get to uh, uh, the next question. So, um, like, it's, it's a really strange argument. Like, I don't like the idea that the pastor is different than the people. I don't like the idea that the shepherd is not the sheep. Okay. <laughs> Like, it sounds like seems what like you Banana. despise authority to me. <laughs> yeah. Do you just not like the idea of authority? Um, maybe, maybe you should ponder that thought. Um, yeah, and it, I mean, Jesus has plenty of words for pastors who desire to be a pastor simply for the sake of the honor. He talks about they make their phylacteries broad and their tassels long and they love the best seats at the synagogue right like a pastor who's after the honor uh is going to be a, a wolf but that doesn't mean that he's not worthy of honor if he's not a wolf in fact he you, you want to guard your pastor with all your might and soul if he's a good pastor because um he watches over your soul and uh it would be no profit to you to lose fat that's again hebrews 13 so you know, it just, it just kind of blows my mind. Uh, and, and like, so where does this come from? Like in the evangelical world, you kind of have two strains and one strain is like, we're all equal. I'm brother John. I'm not really a pastor. I'm, I'm just brother John who talks and demands your obedience to my teaching when you disagree, but, but we're all equal. We swear. So is that kind of like pretend non-authority that never works out? And then where it really leads to is in, in most ev evangelical churches these days, the pastor is like the divinely inspired prophet. Oh, like yeah. he is the visionary and, and the one who speaks for God and discerns God's will in the community. And all this stuff is like, you think the pastor just standing up and repeating absolution that Jesus spoke is like 
too much power. Jeez. I mean, try the guy who's like, this is what God wills for our community. I was like, gee. I, mean, I have a, a word of the year. Yeah, right. 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 Okay. So, Luke, I'm sorry if you don't show this to your wife. Talk, learn from it and then talk to your wife um, because she's not going to like my snark. But I, I, I just – it. what hurts is the idea like to say that this good thing that God created shouldn't be seen as what the word says it is. Forget the absolution. That the pastor shouldn't appear as distinguished from the congregation – like, it's very clear. Yes, he should. Um, and if you don't have these shepherds, uh, then you are you are sheep without a shepherd. That's not good. And Jesus kind of is sad when that happens. And so he sends laborers into the harvest field. I mean, it's, it's just really clear. Does that mean he's a better person? Like, again, he shouldn't think that. But you kind of should, actually. That's that's why like, he should know the Bible more than you. Um he should pray more often than you do. Uh, he should uh, he should be above reproach. Um, and this this is good for you. It gives you a model. It gives you someone to imitate. Um, you can imitate him the way he imitates Paul, the way Paul imitates Jesus, and that's all Scripture too. So it's just it's a strange thing these Bible believing Christians who love their verses, but not all of them. Um, it, it makes me think of recently. I've been. <sighs> As I encounter struggles that um, that people have, I've been trying to think of how does this how does this show the curse that we were given at, um, that's explained in Genesis chapter three, and this makes me think of specifically like women's curse in chapter three. Yeah. Let's see, where is it? verse 16 b your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you it's like the rebellion in her heart of of her desire for man's power man's place and just dis, and disdaining the fact that he has that power and she doesn't and not that she is in so many you know words she may consciously be. yeah, being right. aware of this but that that despising of the father authority i mean that's in that's that's what our society right now is teaching us and she's just uh being led and everything about i mean everything about american are. evangelicalism's hatred of uh of clergy is their yeah. hatred of authority that comes out of the american kind of revolutionary rebelliousness um and this this notion that authority itself is bad mm -hmm. power corrupts no it doesn't no, it doesn't. We corrupt power because we are already corrupted. God has absolute power and he is incorruptible. Amen. Power does not corrupt. All right. Um, can fallen man have absolute power and not have it corrupt him? Um, well, that's a different question. Um, that doesn't, I mean. Only if it's in God's plan well, that's, for him to not be corrupted. You know. <laughs> how many fathers kill their infant children hmm. or sell them into slavery. Most fathers, even bad ones, feed them. Hmm. Okay. So like, well, that's absolute power again. Right. So that this whole thing, it is about the father. And it's like, so are you going to get mad that the father's in charge of the home? Mm -hmm. Are you, are you mad that the father has sort of the honor in the home for his role more than, than woman does? Like if someone comes over uh, you know, the father is kind of the, the official greeter. Right. And at a certain level, it's, it's his house. Right. Um, that we would talk about. You take the last name of the man. Like it's all the same thing. It's just you just don't like it in church, which is like the one place you should want it more than anywhere else. Mm -hmm. You should really want to know who your overseer is in the Lord so you can hold him accountable. Yeah. And isn't it amazing how um, as we're as we're courting different Christians of different denominations um, and thinking about marriage, how we think, oh, well, you know, it won't matter that they're Roman Catholic and I'm a Lutheran or that they're Baptist and I'm a Lutheran because, you know, we're, we're both basically both believe the Bible says the same thing. And all these little areas just come up. And if you're not, um, if you're not pulling the same direction mm -hmm. in your yoke, it's just this, the unequalness shows and it makes for 
tough nights. I mean, like we are equally yoked and we have tough nights. <laughs> so <laughs> so I mean, it's like throwing more more in the mix is just so challenging. If, if you both believe the Bible's true, should work out. You got to keep going to the Bible. Um, and to be fair, the way that most Lutherans talk about the office of the ministry, even the way the catechism is set up, Luther's questions and answers, doesn't always convey the idea. And it's not like saying, well, John 20, the apostles got forgiveness, so the pastors have it. It's not like that's a, a, a close-cut case. It was in the 1500s. Nobody even questioned it. Like The apost apostolic ministry, obviously, preaching the word, is continued in the pastoral office. Like, um, overseers appointed in every place, um, and they're there to preach the word. Like that, that, and it is obvious when you read First Timothy three, and see see what's happening in that text, right? Um, that that Paul is appointing someone to carry on the work of proclaiming what the scriptures say after the apostles die. Um, but John twenty doesn't say that by itself. Right. Mm -hmm. So you have a couple of pieces that have to string together. You have some pearls that you have to string together from throughout the scripture. Um, again, I find, I think the easiest argument like, is to say that, well, do you think the pastor should preach? Like, sure. okay. So like you go to church and like, should somebody stand up and say something about the Bible? Yes. I think that, okay. That's all absolution is. It's just taking everything you could say from the whole Bible and it's just boiling it down to one point, which is that Jesus wants me to forgive you. Rock on, people. Jesus wants me to forgive you today. You're forgiven, right? Like, really, you got a problem with that? What they got a problem with is Roman Catholic nonsense that they're reading into what it looks like when the Roman Catholic priest takes the Lord's Supper for you, mm -hmm. right? This, this, they think it's that. When he represents Christ to God as a new non-bloody sacrifice in order to make imputation or uh, yeah, uh, Im, Im, imputation, Im, impugnment in order to make new righteousness that he can turn around and give to you. Like they think it's that. So what's well, not that? I'm just telling you what Jesus said. Like he said it. He said, go forgive people. I forgive you. Do you want me not to? Want me to withhold it? Y'all just confess your sins, but well, I sure hope you really believe. I mean, that's what they get in those churches that she's in, though. So, or was in, or whatever. But your back hurting you? Yeah, I don't. I don't love the recline. It's nice to be able to sit, like, in an alignment. Well, Have you, my head over my. You can my move the the mic forward. Over my yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not nice to recline. No. <laughs> Most people disagree with you, Meredith. I don't like it. <laughs> All right. So uh, here we go. Uh, a longer question. Um, one of the questions you received last week really struck me in the heart. The question was about why early communion is wrong because younger children don't really understand what they're doing. And if I recall, I made the case that um, as soon as they understand, they understand. So I don't think yeah, early communion question, is wrong. Mm -hmm. The question said it was. And for the listener oh, who sorry. doesn't know, yes. <laughs> I'm making sure they know that I You're advocated so for Thank early you. early communion. Right. I, uh, I didn't advocate for infant communion, but I did advocate for, for earlier communion than age 14. Um, she goes on, I'm think, I think I'm different than most Lutherans I know on this topic. I truly don't understand why we don't commune our Lutheran babies, so this is pedo communion, uh, right away after baptism. The pastor quite literally examines and absolves the baby of all sins in holy baptism. Parents or godparents answer on behalf of the baby. See, I see that a little differently. I see that as examining the parents who are bringing the child forward to give the child the gift that God has given. And so they answer for their child in lieu of the child coming to believe these things. I'm not saying the child doesn't have faith in Jesus, but the child does not know how to um, actually discern sin or something like that. I, I think that would be a, mat a maturation that they receive later of the faith, which is, which is simple in the infant. It's much more simple. Anyway, um, so I'm not quite sure I agree with that, but but um, you say the formula of Concord argues quite strongly that the spiritual eating and drinking of Christ by faith, which our Lutheran babies most emphatically do after baptism because of what Christ has done for babies in baptism, is what constitutes the beneficial physical eating and drinking in the Lord's Supper for the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. So no, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that the faith which believes in the Lord's Supper as you eat the Lord's Supper is exercised by babies after baptism. Because you can only exercise what they're talking about while you're eating the Lord's Supper. Now, you're making the claim they can do that, but it doesn't say they do that. Please notice, you're going to you're quoting the formula of Concord. Did they commune babies? 
You think they didn't think this through? They thought this through too. And so you can't take something they're talking about, which is about how the benefit of the Lord's Supper is faith. That's what they're talking about. The benefit of the Lord's Supper is faith. Um, it is not saying that the Lord's Supper is a spiritual eating and drinking that ascends to eat on Christ while we eat bread and wine here below. That's what the Reformed teach. And they're actually condemning that in that very same article. Okay, um, So don't use the formula for things it's not meant for. It's, it is always highly attuned. It's a sniper rifle of theology. So you pull something out of its context um, and it's, it's not going to help you. Um, oh, look at this. We have... To ban it. How do I do that? Right here, there's a little button. Ban... Ban the porn peoples. Um, they're gone. All right. I still have to see it. Anyway. Uh, so you go on to say, I mean, I, I see what you're saying, though. You're saying that the baby has faith, which is true. Okay. That is true. The formula also says it's impossible for any Christian who possesses true and living faith to receive the supper to their judgment. Um, it's not talking about babies. It's talking about those who are communicants. And for their entire worldview, this means people who have been examined and absolved. The Augsburg Confession says you should not commune unless you're examined and absolved. The Formula of Concord is an exposition of the Augsburg Confession. So you can't just take these phrases and pull them out and treat them like Proverbs. You probably shouldn't do that even with the Proverbs, right? Um, so it is true that the Christian who's worried about, do I have enough faith to take the Lord's Supper, shouldn't be worried about it. That's true. That's the point of this, this comment, right? Um, so, but in your opinion, denying our babies, our baptized babies, communion actually casts doubt on whether or not God really gave the babies true faith in their baptism and suggests that real faith doesn't come till they are smart enough to pass confirmation class. Um, so I disagree with that. Although I don't disagree with how that's probably how it feels by the time you're 14. So I'm, I'm with you. I'm just not with you all the way down to babies. Okay. I'm, I'm. I do not believe that expecting the child to know what he is eating and drinking casts doubt on their faith. It casts doubt on their ability to examine themselves, which if you want a Bible verse and we're going to look at it, 1 Corinthians 11 says, examine yourself. Is that the heart and soul of communion? It's all about examining? No, 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 no. But it is something that the Bible says about the Lord's Supper that it doesn't say about baptism. Okay. Um, in fact, there's, there's even less on baptism in one sense than there's on the Lord's Supper. There's just what baptism does. Um, and this is where also tradition does matter when for 2000 years, it's all been done a certain way. Well, maybe you need a Bible verse to change it. Right. And, and when there is a Bible verse that kind of explains why you maybe should take it at face value. Right. Now, uh, I'm going to say more just about this whole topic in general, but let's let's finish the question. Um, I, it, I get what you're feeling here because I, I know how I felt in eighth grade when I was confirmed. I felt like I was finally a real Christian after I proved it to the pastor. Yeah, see, that's bad. Confirmation, bad. I'm not a fan. Uh, proved it to the pastor, uh, my family, and everyone else by my efforts at confirmation. Yeah, that's that's a really that's not what we wanted to do. It shows you that the process is is not functioning as we thought it should. Um, now I think that confirmation class sort of taught me as a Lutheran a Lutheran version of works righteousness. Yeah, I probably did. Um, I'm glad I learned everything that I did, but I still think there's something really wrong with the traditional way of doing this among Lutherans, where true faith is equated with being really smart. Yeah, yeah. Hey Germans, problem problem, danger, Will Robinson, and all that. Um, I just don't see any biblical or theological reason for not communing our Lutheran babies and young children. Okay. Um, biblical reason. Uh, I want to finish the question, but biblical reason. 1 Corinthians 11. But let a man examine himself and let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. That's, that's the biblical reason. Well, that doesn't apply to babies. Why not? If all nations applies to babies, why would this not apply to babies? Um, Seems like the Lord's Supper requires you to examine yourself. It's like the the benefit of the Lord's Supper is it makes you examine yourself mm -hmm. as a forgiven sinner. So the child not able to do that just yet isn't able to do that just yet. Yeah. Um, so that's what I see as if you want a reason, there's a reason. Um, if anything, when the kids are younger, they're more open to the pastor teaching them. I agree. Although there aren't many one-year-olds who are open to my teaching, right? Um, plenty of six-year-olds open to my teaching. So, uh, you know, the, the infant, not, not, not so much able to like 
understand. More just kind of stares at you. Right. Um, so, but I, I completely agree that like eighth grade is too late. I, I th- and this is where like, didn't I answer this? Didn't I say this last time? Um, uh, I, I feel like I, I kind of gave you the answer, but you want me to directly address uh, the infants. So, um, uh, yeah, I think he wants you to agree with him. The, they're more open to the pastors teaching them how to prepare themselves because kids don't care anymore these days. You're talking about the older kids then. Um, by the time they're 14 or even 9 or 10, honestly, it's depressing how much Lutheran Lutherans cling to a tradition on this matter rather than really thinking it through what we do on the basis of the Bible and our doctrine. Well, um, I think I think that I, I have thought this through based on the Bible doctrine and tradition. And what the conclusion I've come to is if you have a tradition that has biblical precedence, I showed it to you. It's one verse. I get it. It may not be the strongest verse you ever heard. That's fine. It's a tradition that has biblical precedence. If you don't have a verse that demands you change the tradition to save something, like theologically, to save a truth, then you you maybe should trust your your elders more than yourself on this one here. And let me just let me just guarantee you something right now. You want to split your church? Start communion babies. It is it is guaranteed to schism the church. Why? Because no one's gonna understand it. No one's going to know why. And someone's going to say, yes, but the Eastern Orthodox commune babies. Um, once. Right after they're baptized. Because they're legalists. So, like, that's a bad argument. Right? Did the babies go to hell? No. Are they actually participating in the regular eating and drinking of the bread and body and blood of Jesus? No, they're not. They treat it like it's a magical formula. Like, lest you, you got to get it one time before you die. Since we baptize you, we got to get it to you. Otherwise you'll die. And then you, you know, John six, you'll, you'll go to hell. Like you're a legalist. Don't be a legalist. Um, the Lord's supper is there to enhance your faith by giving you a place to trust in Jesus. According to very specific words until the child is able to say, I want that. I believe that our tradition indeed is to believe he cannot examine himself as the text says and to ask the parents to teach the child to begin to examine himself so that he is prepared this should have nothing to do with passing a test where you memorize 600 questions about all the dogmatics of the lutheran church ever that that's a bad idea i agree it should not be wait until you're 16 or 14 or 10 or too late to actually care i agree but that doesn't mean like eighth day time to commune uh you're 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 making it up otherwise it would be here it would be here you're like claiming the church is gone in a sense right um the lord's supper is practiced according to its institution which is that first in the oxford confession um one must be examined and absolved actually the absolution you got to be have heard the gospel right um and yeah i guess the second week the kids in church he's heard the gospel but can he confess his sins? No, he can't confess his sins. So, you know, so we wait a little while. Um, it's a fight not worth having. Um, if I had inherited Pedo communion and the whole church did Pedo communion, I don't know that I would like go to this verse and change it either because I would say that's not enough of a verse to change 2000 years of, of tradition. It's not enough of a verse, um, but it's enough of a verse to have 2000 years of tradition not be changed without a more clear verse. Like you need to commune the kids when they're two. Right? Like we don't, ha- we don't have that. Um, we have let a man examine himself. And so let him eat. Nah. I don't know if you want to say anything or, or move I think on. You've, I think you've covered it's it a hard one. question. I, it'll just divide. It'll just divide the church. And that's why, that's why almost every pastor who's ever come across this and thought about it, the way you thought about it, we all realize, Oh, I'm not going to split the church. Not over something that doesn't have very clear, very clear um, uh, requirement from scripture. What I'm going to do is I'm going to feed those kids as soon as they want, want to be fed. And um, cause that's what it's for is to feed the desire. Um, and I'm going to point them to their baptism until then, because that's what's already there as an external promise. Uh, it's almost like you devalue baptism a little bit by doing this um, sort of. Um, all right. Next question. Uh, Pastor and Meredith, I'm writing because both my husband and I felt feel at a loss for what to do in our current situation with my parents. I grew up in a relatively stable non-denominational church with a loving and relatively stable family. 
I'm just going to say, did you know? Um, my husband grew up the eldest of four sons to a Lutheran pastor in a very stable family. The fine stable. When he and I first started dating, my family loved him. My dad gave him his blessing to marry me. Wedding plans were underway. But as time went on, they started to grow more and more jealous of the time I was spending talking to him and of the fact that I was starting to come under his spiritual leadership rather than my father's, especially when I started questioning some of the theologies I'd grown up hearing. Eventually, the tension between my family and I increased to the point that my close friends and soon-to-be in-laws urged me to move out of my parents' house because they were concerned for my health. I did so, and that was when my father recanted his blessing on the marriage. That was about 10 months ago. Since then, I've stayed in contact with my parents, but it's been a rough road. Every conversation I have with them leaves me feeling intensely guilty. I've tried setting boundaries, but every boundary I've tried to set, they've objected to telling me that I have no right. They've sent me articles and videos telling me that I shouldn't submit to my husband because they still think my leaving them was his decision, not mine. I want to establish healthy communication with them, but they don't even believe it's me texting them sometimes. They also tell me constantly that I'm not the same person they once knew. I haven't even told them that I was confirmed in the LCMS not long ago. My pastor has heard the whole story and it's his opinion that my husband happened to be the catalyst for an explosion that was inevitable. Yes. Listen to the guy. Um, as I said, I'm at a loss for what to do next. I want to try to reconcile, but taking um, talking to them only seems to be making things worse. I was wondering if you could give your thoughts on the matter. So I'm just going to go back and say, they tell you constantly that you're not the same person they once knew. They're not the people you thought they were. So when you tell me you grew up in a stable family, I'm going to say, I don't think so. Based on your story. I'm going to tell you that you have trauma that you don't know about, that you have hidden from yourself so that you could survive in a very hostile environment. I don't know what that means because that can take a lot of different shapes. And I'm not even going to say that it's not also in your husband's family because it tends to take two to tango. We tend to dance to the same tunes. What I'm going to say, though, is that, again, uh, they're wrong to say such things to you. And the shame that you feel when you speak with them is really all the proof that you need. They don't give a crap about you. They care about them. From there, um, reconciliation may or may not be possible. Certainly, wanting to have a healthy relationship with an unhealthy person is not possible. And so there is a time and there is a place where in order for your own family, for your own mental stability, you might need to not talk to people who are unstable. And someone who's going to tell you if you're already married, um, you should leave him. You didn't really marry him. It doesn't count. That person's not just unstable. They're like, they're, they're not biblical. Like they're like, I don't know where their faith is. I don't know. Like Jesus on the last day, he'll do what he's going to do. But like, that's not a good sign when you're like destroying marriage. That That's called adultery, right? Altering the marriage formula. The fact that they won't believe you, that it's you texting them and they insist that you're being manipulated, that shows you who they are. I love my wife. I wanted your affirmation on that point. So when you when you get when you get there, the fact that they think he's manipulating you tells you how they operate in their heads. Yeah. Yeah? I want you to go on this one. Yeah, I know you've got pieces on it. Um my first my first thought. It's um, it's really hard because it's like hearing my story told back to me in so many words. Uh-huh. So my heart goes out to you because at a time when you need your family 
to be behind you, supporting you and lifting you up as you spread your wings and go on to the next chapter of your life to, to be a wife. Um, they're just not there. And, and so that, that all too important part of parenthood has been stolen from you. Like you have not been given that part of, of a parent and it's not impossible to start your new relationship, your new life with your husband, um, and to be strong together, but it's hard. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) what they don't realize as they try to divide you is that because you two have founded your relationship on Christ, um, this kind of trial and and testing of your faith is only going to bring you you and your husband closer together so it's actually working against their plan <laughs> they're trying so hard to separate you and and they're actually gluing you together close um more tightly so god be praised for that because um Because this is the relationship that, or this is the head that you have now. Your husband is your head and, and, um, and this is the beginning of the rest of your life. And so being committed to one another in a way that you can stand firm against the buffeting of this world will serve you well. Um, but it's going to be a long road and it's hard, (laughs) but you know what? I don't, Honestly, I don't know what another type of marriage is is like because that was what ours was. <laughs> uh, but I kind of think all marriage just is hard. You know, it's it's all just bumpy. If you're facing it. Yeah. If you're facing it. Um. Yeah, so you win. Tears. <laughs> uh, I... As far as the boundaries are concerned, if you haven't read the book Boundaries, going through and reading it is going to be very helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, Because when I was in this situation in my own life, I thought boundaries meant setting up those, those firm fences for people so that they knew where they couldn't come. I didn't recognize that it also means allowing people to act out and mm-hmm. knowing that I can't change them. Yeah. And so if I had read the book <laughs> instead of just gone off of what other people or my husband was telling me from his experience with the book, I might have, um, I don't know, maybe we read it together, but I don't remember highlighting and taking mm-hmm. notes and yeah. really walking through it the way that I just did. And part of that too is mental of maturity. Like you just, Mm -hmm. as you get older, you can comprehend things better. So as a 19 year old, I wasn't going to catch what now as an almost 40 year old, I am going to be able to um, understand and catch and then apply. My rhetoric is better now, but um, recognizing, I mean, just the key point is that we cannot change other people. All we can do is respond to them. So, And you cannot reconcile with someone who does not want to reconcile. You can forgive them, but you cannot reconcile. Exactly. And that was another point that the book laid firmly for me. It just exposed. It said they were very clear in saying that forgiveness is a one-person deal. You can definitely forgive them. Um, you don't have to badmouth them to your friends. You don't have to dwell on how evil they are and how they've wronged you every day. Um, when it comes up, when they do harsh things to you, definitely let yourself feel the pain and the anger and the frustration and the betrayal. But, um, but you can forgive them. Reconciliation only comes when they show you that you can trust them once again. Then once you see I can trust that person, the relationship can be um, fostered or or built up again. Um, Well-meaning friends and family will come into this situation and say, why haven't you forgiven them? 
and you need to stand firm in your heart. If you have the courage to stand firm against them, you can say it to them too, but I have forgiven them. I absolutely have and I will continue to forgive them. But we just are having trouble with the reconciliation part. But I'm not going to let them treat me like that. Exactly. Anymore. And that's the fence. You know, that's where that's where we draw the lines and we say, You you will not hurt me in this way. You this is not treatment that I deserve nor want. Uh, having boundaries is 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 knowing inside yourself what you need and want and desire. And then expressing to other people that you in interact with on varying levels of intimacy um, what you need and want and desire and sometimes we forget that it's the in inside part too you know that we have to recognize what I want and we try to we try to set up these boundaries with people and just hope that they'll be happy for us (laughs) and they're not going to be And when the relationship really matters is when it's really important that we stay firm. Yeah. And boundaries are about letting other people be upset for themselves. Yes. And not taking on their emotions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So, uh, and that it doesn't not include then um, drawing lines in which you expect certain types of behaviors or those other things won't happen, right? Like a... Um, I'm not going to come over for dinner if this is how I'm treated. I just, exactly. I'm not going to do that. Um, uh, or, you know, maybe you're strong enough and it's just petty enough that you're like, all right, yep, there there she went again, bad mouthing everyone at the table during dinner. But, you know, it's, it's all over now and I'm going to go home. And, you know, I I just love my mom anyway kind of thing, right? So, like, there's there are layers to how you can apply this. Um, but the fact that you had to move out of the house um, sounds like uh, – you got things to discover in your past that you don't remember. Yeah. That's what it sounds like to me. Um, and that this is normal. It's all too normal and common, in fact, these days. Um, but it is normal that if you have trauma, you deny your trauma. Like you don't admit that you have it. Um, and then something sparks an awareness that maybe there's more. And um, it can be really rough figuring that out. Honestly, as you get more secure in your in your own skin, <laughs> as you um, experience the the freedom that boundary allows you emotionally to to feel your emotions and then to allow other people to feel their emotions without it impacting you in um, an intimate way. I mean, it doesn't mean that you're callous and you're just like, oh, well, you just go throw a fit in that corner by yourself. You know, no, we can be compassionate, but we don't have to then try to change their feelings. You know, right. they're sad. Well, that stinks. But be sad. You know, let let them right. be sad. I don't have to change you what don't I'm have doing to be sad because they're them. sad about me right. doing something that's perfectly all right so as you develop that distance from this scenario in your life from your your parents um little things like jonathan you were saying are going to rise up and you'll notice oh my goodness i never thought of it that way but look if i had only known then what i know now i would have recognized that 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 memory that story of my past actually foreshadows what then happened 10 months ago to you Mm -hmm. um and be patient with yourself uh i i don't know if your husband watches this show but it'd be good for him to watch this with you so that he can kind of just be prepared um knowing what to expect and how to support you through through this trial um so i gave this advice recently to someone and and i think it is it's B plus advice. Um, someone came up to me and was talking about their own trauma and past. And I said, you know, I don't, I don't want to be the one to tell you, you do or you do not have complex post-traumatic stress disorder. But I know that Peter Walker's book, complex post-traumatic stress disorder from surviving to thriving. One of the things he points out is that, CPTSD 
expresses itself in a way that looks like a lot of other traumatic responses. In fact, it's kind of like the perfect storm of a little bit of all of that. And so I can suggest to you that you read the book not because you have it, but because somewhere in there you're going to trigger something you do know. And then that will give you the thread to start pulling on for the rest of it. And um, the book is uh, it's a single shot. It's fairly recent as a concept. It's almost too popular. Everyone's got CPTSD the way all they have ADHD and all this kind of stuff. Um, he has some sort of Near Eastern views on, on mystical approaches to things. Um, and he... Uh, he definitely doesn't ha have a Christian view on forgiveness. Um, but, you know, if you're, if you're looking to try to, like, expose the wound, and in my point of view, like, the best thing you can do is expose the wound. Like, until you expose the wound, you cannot heal the wound. You need to expose the wound. And uh, he says this in the book, too. Once you expose it, once you actually start pulling that thread, get ready. Waterfall might just hit you in the face. And, uh, and we found that that first year uh, it was a waterfall. Um, yeah. Uh, but the result of lancing that boil uh, is you can then begin to heal. Um, so. Uh, and then the Daring Greatly talks about shame. Um, she has other books as well. I haven't read all of her books, but um, Brene Brown writes about how uh, just how to face the shame that we we all have shame um the society that we're growing up in in these past years decades um it just produces people of shame and so giving you some at least ways to recognize it and maybe some tools to to think about as you're ways to think about it as you encounter it um I found that to be very helpful. The woman who interviewed my husband, before you go to the seminary, you have to go through an interview process with your district. And um, the woman who was there, there was a man and a woman doing the interview. Upon hearing what I had to go through, they immediately <laughs> assigned that I go to counseling, which... Um, it was, it was probably it fine. Bad. It was it probably was fine. fine. Yeah. Um, actually, the second counselor that I went to was really helpful just to be able to talk about it because putting it into words was so confusing. I had not ever considered my parents in this way before, and I couldn't. It just blew me away that my best friends, I literally looked at them as my best friends, would betray me at such an important time in my life and tell me that because I wanted to do what was so normal and natural for children once they've grown, which is to, to get married and start my own family, to tell me that that was demon possession. That was, um, it was so hard to balance in my brain. It was so confusing. And so to have somebody to talk to, it really was helpful. The first counselor I went to was not so helpful. Um, she had an agenda and wanted to, wanted to force it on me as far as that my scenario fit into her agenda. And so be discerning if you go the counseling route. Um, but the woman at the interview had said to me, because of this, one day, and I don't look it right now, one day you're going to be a very strong person. And I remember thinking, I don't, I can't even imagine that because I feel so small and I feel so trodden upon. But then I think about it. I think about the road that we've been on and where God has led us, and all of you guys out there listening to us. And I, all I can do is praise him for, for giving me those trials so that then when you have these issues, I can at least share my side with you. 
even if I have a terrible cold that makes me sound squeaky like a mouse and I keep crying. (laughs) So hang in there, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. You're going to be strong, strong someday in ways you can't imagine right now. Yeah. Uh, And it, it'll be on the other side of an ordeal, but it will be for the good of somebody else too. Um, You're going to, through this, learn about your humanity in a way that makes you a more merciful and uh, not co-enabling mercy. None of this niceness and just kind of do it and get pushed around and the other person's worse off than before because you helped them be. But a truly merciful person. Um, And the beautiful thing, oh, I'm sorry, I don't want you to lose. The beautiful thing about it has been that as we spent all of those years working on my issue as a couple and my parents and how that um, impacted us, once it came time for Jonathan's CPTSD to be like brought to the surface, I had tools then that I could share with him or at least just support him through um, his trial with, you know, so that it didn't crush me as, um, as we were exploring the, what, what did you call it? The waterfall? Yeah. So, um, so once you breach the dam, even though your husband doesn't, I mean, it looks like he comes from a completely stable family. You, what you learn as you guys wade through this muck, um, will be able to help you down the road. If something were to come up on his side where he just, realize oh my goodness this isn't what i was expecting like it's very possible that they're a completely stable family that would be not the normal way that a traumatized person meets marries a person um it's helpful to me to think of all of us as being kind of like puzzle pieces and there's a certain type of puzzle piece that you will fit into and there's other puzzle pieces that you'd be like i like that person but we did nah. And it just doesn't happen. And you tend to link up with similarly challenged people. Yeah, because you speak the same language. Your traumas match. (laughs) Your traumas tend to match. Now, there are exceptions. Okay. But my advice to your husband, if he's willing to hear it, is you probably have real challenges like her family that you have not admitted to yourself. And you may never be able to admit just be open to the possibility that you have matching puzzle pieces and that somewhere in there um, you, you'll be benefit from digging. Nobody really gets hurt by exploring their psychology and trying to improve it. Like you're not really going to get hurt. All you're going to do is find what's there. Well, and so, honestly, it's it, we're so in Carvatis <laughs> that as we try to help other people through their trouble, it's it's almost impossible for us to not kind of read ourselves into it like when i was Mm -hmm. going through the cptsd book alongside of you um there were different things where it was like oh yeah i i can see myself in this scenario i can see how that's describing what i went through and so for a few times like we actually had to discuss do i have cptsd and and you know what no but like it's made up of a bunch of other stuff and so that's that's why i recommended it is like it might target it might show you some so of your corners. He, though, you know, if if he dives in with you, yeah, in exploring how to support you in this, he will just become a more um, emotionally intelligent person. Yeah, yeah, and that will benefit you greatly because yeah. that um, Gottman, I think his name is John Gottman. He's a relationship expert, and he talks about how emotionally intelligent men men who are able to tap into their emotions they're the ones that actually do have more success in marriage because we women are so emotional and um when you can be real with it and and not just uh think it's silliness but really act take it at face value for being something they it it gives your relationships a very deep, lasting um, quality. Lots of cheerleading for you in the comments, by you the way. You guys are so sweet. You're going to make me cry. Oh, <laughs> here it goes. But you're not on screen, at least for a moment. We've got the last question here. 
Um, uh, Dear Rev Fisk, our choir began practicing the song Lord Make Us Worthy by Natalie Sleeth, who was a wife of a Methodist pastor. I asked what was meant by make us worthy, and the choir director was a little confused. I am formerly reformed, and I have never understood that we are made worthy of Christ. Everyone kind of piped in, well, we don't make ourselves worthy, but God does. Is that a Lutheran belief that we are made worthy of Christ? I don't know if I can sing this song unless I know it is right theologically. So um, I think the idea that I would need to be made worthy of Christ is a very strange concept since it is Christ who makes me worthy, right? So, so to be worthy of Christ, I, I'm not worthy of Jesus dying on the cross for me. I'm not worthy to take and eat without his command. But his dying on the cross for me has declared me to be worthy of salvation and worthy of um, Christian faith. Um, It has given that to me. That very worthiness is the imputation of the righteousness of Christ. So I agree with you. It's a little bit of a strange way of talking. But then I did a little, little digging. And um, what I discovered is some texts about worthiness in the Bible. So here is one from Matthew uh, this is chapter 10, verse 37, where Jesus says, He who loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. Okay, there's worthy of Christ right there. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Does that mean we need to justify ourselves and become worthy of Jesus? No, it doesn't mean that. Uh, What he's talking about there is faith, right? And that if your faith is in other things, then your faith is not in him, right? Um, So I, I, I wouldn't use this verse to to sing, make me worthy of Christ. Although I can see where maybe someone based on this verse would say, well, I'd like to be worthy of following Christ. I I can see them saying that. I still think it's a weird thing to sing. And and we'll come back to that. We'll look at the actual text of it. But, but I, I can at least like, no, no, no. I, I really do want Christ to make me worthy. I really do. And that that means taking up my cross. Um, the parable of the wedding feast, Matthew 22. The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing. Then he said to his servants, verse 8, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Well, what made them not worthy? Well, not hearing Christ. So again, I don't think it undoes my initial comment. Christ, the point of Jesus is he makes you worthy. That, that's like the point. So to, to, to pray to Jesus, make me worthy as if he hasn't, is weird. But I can see how I would I would want to pray for more faith, pray for strong devotion, pray that I would believe in the worthiness that he has achieved and not doubt it. I could see that. And I could say, don't let me be one of those who's unwilling to come. Make me worthy. Right? But but that doesn't mean anything other than forgive my sins, not from where I'm at. Now we got John the Baptist back in Matthew chapter 3. I love this. Uh, he says, um, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. So he recognizes that he's not worthy of Christ. I don't think that he asks Jesus to make him worthy of Christ apart from Christ, however, right? So this is, this is where, like, what is the song really asking for? And can you sing it? Um, does it mean well? And even if it means well, does it actually end up doing bad? Now, here's where I think it gets really super intriguing. Oh, where did it go? There it is. Acts chapter um, 5, where the apostles, after being called before the Sanhedrin, are beaten and they depart from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy of to suffer. Now, that that is just going to pick up steam as we go to Ephesians chapter 4. I therefore, prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy 
of the calling to which you were called with long suffering. Hmm. The unity of the Spirit, one faith, one hope, one baptism. Philippians uh, chapter 1, verse 27, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel, standing fast in one spirit with one mind, striving not in any way terrified by your adversaries. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer. Colossians chapter 1. Be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing, being fruitful in every good work for all patience and suffering. Long-suffering, excuse me. Uh, 1 Thessalonians, he lab- Paul labors and toils that you would walk worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Um, and then 2 Thessalonians, uh, that in persecutions and tribulations that you endure, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you be counted worthy of the kingdom for which you also suffer. Therefore, we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy for this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness in the work of faith with power. That the name of Jesus may be glorified in you. So what I see there is that if you're going to pray to be counted worthy as a Christian, you're asking for suffering. That's what I see. You're asking for patience. You're asking for gentleness. You're not asking for salvation itself. You are praying as one who is saved for a fuller experience of believing that, which ultimately comes on the other side of not experiencing a life that's very good. Now, here is the song. All right. Uh, Blessed by his coming, touched by his birth, Graced by his glory here on the earth. It's like a third grader wrote it. <laughs> Fed by his wisdom. We can't all be amazing. I know. Have easy, patience. Easy, <laughs> easy, my poor little heart. <laughs> Fed by his wisdom. All who believe, Lord, make us worthy such gifts to receive. So here it's like you're praying for worthiness to receive the gift of worthiness And notice the absence of suffering. Spared by his mercy, healed by his skill, saved by his sorrow, bound by his will, raised by his power, all who believe, Lord, make us worthy such gifts to receive. Again, you know, he says, if you don't take up your cross and follow me, you're not worthy of me. And this song can be saying, you know, well, then make me worthy. It's, it's, it's fine. Um... Sent by the Father, humbly he came, Master and Savior, him we proclaim. All who have found him now as before, offer him honor and praise evermore. He is worthy. Led by his Spirit, claimed by his love, filled with his promise, word from above, called to his service, meaning teaching Sunday school, right? Meaning like having your own ministry in your career, right? Oh, wait, mate, called to his service. What does that mean? Um, all who believe, O oh Lord, make us worthy, each of us worthy, Lord, make us worthy, such blessings to receive. So it's it's not wrong. It's not really right. It's, it talks about Jesus, which is nice. There's some yeah. good things about Jesus. They're fine. If I heard this on the radio, I'd be like, sure. Um would I, if I heard it in church because my cantor picked it, I'd be like, okay, would I pick it? Mm-mm. No, I wouldn't. And and again, are you asking for salvation? Then this is bad. Um, are you asking for faith to endure trials and temptations? Then this is great. It just never actually says that. Yeah, there's just not a whole lot that it's it's not very clear. And so that's the tricky part. You know, it kind of throws out those those Christian words in a rhyme, but the, it's not clear on how it's using them and what the meaning behind it is. I mean, where would you even put this in a service? Yeah, led by his spirit, what does that mean? Claimed by his love. 
I can fill that with something, right? Filled with his promise. I mean, I can fill that with something, right? What does that mean though? What's the promise? Because the promise isn't that I'm worthy apparently. And that's kind of it. That isn't the promise that I'm worthy. Um, uh, oh, look, they're back. How did you get back? I banned you. I banned you again. Uh, the same one? Yeah. Oh, I mean, it's the same company. They're, they're gone. Um, but golly. they're still coming. Yeah, but it's it's grayed out. So they're they're posting oh. it, but it just they it's a bot. Um, so, you know, call to his service again. What 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 does that mean? It's it's fine. Um, it's cotton candy. Uh, cotton candy won't kill you unless it's all you eat, and then it will, right? So. Um, I don't think you should feel like you can't sing this at, at your Lutheran church because it's part of everything else at your Lutheran church and it's surrounded by everything else at your Lutheran church. Like, it's okay. I think your question is a good one. Um, I think the question, am I not worthy, is the most important one. So when I'm praying for him to make me worthy, if, if I'm going to do that biblically, I'm asking for him to make me embrace the suffering that I face to make the worthiness he has purchased for me one which I see and understand as a willingness to ultimately turn the other cheek against my neighbor. Uh, so do we have, so then we have a place for this thought process in our, in our doctrine, in our theology as Lutherans. Like it's so prevalent in the Caleb experience, this like make me worthy kind of idea. And what you're saying is as Lutherans, we see it as, um, it's kind of like a stretch me, discipline me so that all I have is you to focus on Lord. Grant me maturity in the faith that I might think such things are as right. Um, I would never call that making me worthy. Right. But they, so they, what do they mean? That's when just it. It, it. it never like, says it. They mean, make me perfect like if, so that I can bear your perfection or kind of something. thing. Right? I mean, because that's what the songs typically or the phrases that they put it into right. typically lead you towards. Right. So again, I, the language of the epistles is really help, helpful here. Lord, make me walk worthy. Yeah. That's just totally different than making me worthy. I, I am worthy. This is why I don't like it is because it, it undermines the very gospel itself with the idea that I'm not worthy, that I'm not pleasing to God, that I'm not justified, that I'm not sanctified, that I'm not elect. I have to somehow still become that. And why would I ask to still become what I have been declared to be? That's the very essence of, of the, the gospel itself. Um, but I will ask, you know, yeah, Lord, may I walk in a manner worthy of the gospel? Yeah, absolutely. May, may the result of the gospel in my life be that I'm not a, a horrible person. That that's that's great. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, but that's that's not what it's doing. You could, but you could fill it with that while you sang it. But that's like that's our understanding of worthiness, and so I, so it's helpful justification to have that to counter, I guess, in my head. Justification is the language of worthiness. Yeah. Righteousness. To be righteous is to be worthy. That's like the, it's like the definition. Right. Um, to be upright, right, as opposed to be downcast. Um, yeah. So, uh, oh, someone asks about Luke 21. Pray that you may be accounted worthy. Um, my guess is this is, again, that, uh, that you might be able to endure the suffering. Luke 21, 36. Um, let's go to that there. Uh, watch therefore and pray that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the son of man. Well, he's talking about how there's um, going to be destruction upon the civilization uh, when Israel itself. So this is, this is the language of the fall of Jerusalem. Okay. Um, and uh, he's telling you to pray that you would avoid being in the city when it falls. I mean, it's very much what it is directly. Um, that worthiness though is still going to be run through everything else. I just, I just read about worthiness. So it's going to be its own form of suffering. Um, I would also, let's see here. Uh, it will come as a snare to those who dwell on the face of the earth it, that you'll be kind of worthy to stand before the son of man. Yeah. So pray for your Christianity. Um, 
Pray that you would be a Christian. Remember the, the apostles at this point, in the, is he talking to the crowds? Parable of the fig tree, there'll be signs. I think he's talking to the apostles. Um, see that you're not deceived. Um, uh, the apostles aren't, hear this carefully, they aren't really Christians till after the resurrection. Okay? Like they're followers of Christ, they're believers, they're Hebrews. No one died for their sins yet. They don't know that's what's going to happen. Um, so on the other side of this, you know, uh, see, at daytime, he's teaching in the temple. So this is actually maybe more public even, too. Um, he's calling to them uh, to repent and believe, right? And so, again, for someone who does believe that now, right, who does believe you have been justified, it's weird to then still need to pray that I would be worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass. I mean... Um, that's what he's done. That's what he's done, right? Um, pray that you may believe. Um, it's not really wrong to pray for more faith. So can you go back to the song again? Yeah. So what, because they list all these different things in the various uh, verses. So yeah. What is it they're saying at the beginning? Because the, it's the first verse that seemed to have all the list of what I... I don't know. The other ones seemed to talk more about what Christ has done. No, blessed by his coming. Okay, so I'm blessed. It's fine. Touched by his birth. Kind of weird. Um, like like Christmas feels nice or something. Like, yeah. Um, but uh, it's fine. Um, graced by his glory. So again, they're all just like... Here on the earth. Put in positions of awe. Yeah. Fed by his wisdom. So which bad. I'll never talk about. That's not the next line, but the, it would rhyme. Almost. <laughs> um, fed by his wisdom, all who believe, maybe to believe is to be wise. Lord, make us worthy such gifts to receive. I mean, it's not wrong. This is just it. It's just like, it's fine. Um, It's like you just didn't need the word worthy in there. Not so much. Help us to believe. Lord, help us to believe. Um, we don't need the worthy part or <laughs> Lord make us walk worthy. I'm, I'd be, I, that's the text of the Bible is to walk worthy. Right. So uh, as opposed to like this ontological existence of worthiness that I don't have yet, according to the song. And so to walk worthy is then to be seen by other people as believing what you as say a you believer believe. in yeah, Christ right. and to give a good testimony to Christ or to give a I mean, good it's, witness. It wants to, to be Christ. a prayer for faith. It wants to be a prayer for faith. That's what it desires to be. It's a Methodist prayer for faith. Of course, a Methodist is going to like put it in sanctification terms. So to live my confession is a, to walk worthy. Yeah. Okay. To not be a hypocrite. Beware the leaven of the scribes and the Pharisees. To not be a hypocrite. Yeah. So I guess, you know, Lord, make me not a hypocrite. It didn't rhyme as well. So maybe as she, I'm assuming this is a woman, but I don't know, actually. Well. So maybe as this person's singing. Sally. Sally. So maybe Sally, as you're singing this song, you can can pray for the salvation of this person. I don't know if they're dead. Oh, I'm sure this person but, like had, well, I don't know. Yeah. They, they wanted Christian faith. They're asking for Christian faith. Or her just, children. Just doing it as a very they might sanctimonious still way. still be in the faith and not burdened by the law that potentially they were right. raised up into. This is just the question. <laughs> aren't you worthy? I mean, are, aren't, aren't you worthy? He is worthy. He has opened the scroll. He has fed you with, I mean, how can you who feast upon the blood of Jesus Christ not be worthy once you've done so? Can, you you can't even make it unholy, and it seems like a, a relatively. I mean, just because the words are easy doesn't mean that the the notes of singing it are easy. But maybe now's your chance to suggest to him that your car, your um, choir would maybe, work on. I don't know. Are you, you're gonna hit like. Uh oh. P- okay, just don't don't listen. Professional to me. church <laughs> workers are pretty defensive of their decision making, even if it's mediocre decision making, and especially those who offer gifts tend to think of their gifts as unassailable. Um, yeah, they have poor boundaries when it comes to criticism. Um, spared by his mercy, make us worthy. See, that's weird. Make me worthy of your mercy. Like when you put it together, make me worthy of your coming, make me worthy of your birth, make me worthy of your glory. Like, yeah, 
are you i mean i mean i i think sally could could in good conscience sit out you and could. just be like you know what i'm busy that day yeah i would but i wouldn't <laughs> I make i wouldn't make sing. a show of it either i'd just be like yeah i just can't sing that one and then be done <laughs> like i wouldn't try to convince anybody it's like you know it's a, it's a quirk it just seems kind of milk toast to me and maybe um, i don't know if they know about your background but to yeah, I that's would good. think that your brothers and sisters in Christ who have welcomed you in would would be sensitive to yeah. the fact that you're coming from a from a traumatic experience yeah. that brought you here to Lutheranism and this just smells too much like it yeah. and you're like I just can't go there yet. Yeah. I, I left a legalistic church and this just smells like what they used to say. <laughs> so I you know I can't do it. Um I have an allergy to evangelicalism. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to, I have an allergy to Methodism. That's actually really fair. I have an allergy to Methodism. Yeah. Um, it's uh, it aggravates my immune system. Um, that's about that's about right. <laughs> so um, yeah, we're we're well past time. And uh, was that all of them? That was all five questions. Wow. And we went to Way like to almost go. eleven before we started because that was that was good stuff earlier though I thought. And then yeah. you made all sorts of fans. And all oh, you gotta you guys. do is just break down and cry, and they're like, "Oh, she's great." <laughs> So, um, which is good. You're so now, sweet you have so to much to me. share. You have so much to share. And that's, that's uh, why I brought you on 50 episodes ago, yeah. uh, was in the hope that we could take, uh, talk about doctrine, um, and not get rid of it, but bring it to the level of, uh, personal faith and piety of application to family and life, uh, of, uh, as a foundation for marriage and child rearing. And so, you know, you've been on this journey with me. 20 plus years. Do we hit 20? Yeah, we hit 20. 20 was last year. Yeah, so right. we're coming up on yeah, being 20. legal. Uh, to drink? <laughs> yeah. We can finally drink as a marriage. <laughs> Our marriage can buy alcohol. Um, yeah, so you've been with me on this journey a long time. And uh, uh, through the thick and thin, we've we've learned a few things. So I think it's... Um, well, they are they are saying uh, that it is it is worth it, and we, that's why we're here. Well, God um, be praised! It's a super big honor to mm-hmm. be walking alongside of you. It's been an honor to be the one washing his clerical and getting getting his oh man equipment dusted. I used to dust your studio, and a few times I messed up the soundboard because <laughs> I dusted too vigorously. All those little notes that I left. I'm sorry, I adjusted your soundboard yeah. while I was dusting. Um, so that to me was a a blessing and a gift to be behind the scenes, and then you so graciously brought me up front, and I just it it's well, an honor to me to be here. You're a gift to me, and what I want to do is share you with everyone else. You can't have her; she's mine. Um, but you can experience some of her insight uh, into humanity, which. Again, like it is not good for man to be alone, and I can I can bring all of these theological answers, um, but that doesn't always mean I do it in a way that makes sense. Um, and uh, well, the the older women are to teach the younger women how to love their husbands and children too. It's it's pretty clearly written. So thanks for being part of this fifty episode. Stop the white it's my noise. Pleasure. Uh, you found stop the white noise with Jonathan and Meredith. I'm Jonathan. And I'm Meredith. If you like what we do here. You please, please, please consider supporting us at patreon.com slash revfisk or subscribestar.com slash revfisk. Get on the subscription model and tell us thank you for what we do in a way that can help us keep it going. Meanwhile, uh, don't want to forget that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. That makes you worthy. <laughs> uh, that's what you're, you're, you're paid for. He, he counted you worthy to die for, not because of what you have done, but because of that's who he is. He is worthy. And he has made you worthy. You're paid for. That makes you immortal now. And that he won't be long in wrapping up this veil of tears. So the water does seal it. That again declares you worthy. The food feeds it. The food food itself is him. He is worthy. He's in you now. Uh, This is Christianity. You should think about joining us and not wallow in the muck with those who have no hope. But lift up your head all the more as you see. uh Oh, I messed that up there. Now I'm messing it up a lot. Um, All the more as you see the day approaching. Rock on and alleluia.
Was that worth a dollar? Click the Patreon link in the show notes to sign up. Pretty please? Ha, ha, ha.